It is Friday the 15th of March. Welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. This is the show where we take all of the news, the good bits and the bad, and dissect them for your entertainment. Tonight, we will be speaking to our panel here in the studio. Later on, we'll be getting a culture fix with Anna Smith. It will be reviewing the latest releases in the world of film. But first, the headlines this hour. And Israel has rejected Hamas' latest ceasefire proposal on the day that Benjamin Netanyahu approved plans for a military operation in Rafah. But a ship carrying 20 tonnes of aid and medical supplies has finally arrived off the coast of Gaza. Protests at Russia's rubber stamp election holds open with Putin on course to secure power for another six years. Turmoil in the Tory party after reports the Conservatives received another five million quid from Frank Hester, the man at the centre of the racism row. And how a swarm of bees caused a racket at the Indian Wells Tennis Tournament in California. Coming up, I'm going to be joined by our panel, Richard Brooks from Private Eye and the comedian and virologist Rialina, both of them with us until nine o'clock, giving us their take on the week's news and the stories that are continuing to gain momentum. So what we're going to be talking about, well, we could be talking about a week for the government that can be summed up by the three Ds, donors, definitions, and Diane Abbott. Can the Tories actually go seven days without a race route? Apparently not. Plus the relaunch of Brand Sussex. Harry and Meghan are back. Not that they ever went away. But in another troublesome week for the royal family, let's just hope Meghan's return to Instagram didn't involve touching up any photos. And in the sport, we are looking ahead to Super Saturday in the Six Nations. Ireland and England fighting for the title. Scotland can still take the Triple Crown. And we're saying goodbye to a Wales and Lions legend. Great to have your company. We are here for the next three hours. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all, Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has downplayed chances of a truce in Gaza, calling the proposals by Hamas unrealistic. Meanwhile, he is understood to have approved plans for a military operation in Rafah. All this as an aid ship loaded with nearly 200 tonnes of food and supplies has arrived off the coast of Gaza. Our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunko, has our first report. Rafah, on the Egyptian border, has become a massive refugee camp for more than a million Gazans who have fled fighting in the north. Moving them to somewhere else in Gaza ahead of a land invasion will probably take some time. But the Israeli government says it has now approved plans for that to happen. We have to see a clear and implementable plan, not only to get uh, civilians out of harm's way, but also to make sure that once out of harm's way, they're appropriately cared for with shelter, with food, with medicine, with clothing. And we've not yet seen such a plan. With Israeli forces closing in, Hamas has delivered a new ceasefire proposal to Israel and said they will now accept an initial temporary ceasefire. They had previously insisted on a permanent one and the withdrawal of all Israeli forces. The Israeli war cabinet met this afternoon and described some of Hamas's demands as unrealistic, but announced a delegation will travel to Qatar for further talks. Hamas's change in position is significant because it removes what had been one of the major obstacles to a new hostage deal. Although the Israeli government has been in public quite dismissive of it, clearly the gap between the two sides is narrowing. After three days sailing, the aid ship finally appeared off the coast of Gaza. Palestinians watched expectantly from the beaches as it came into the offing. Satellite images taken over the past few days show a temporary pier being constructed ahead of the ship's arrival. The first aid from the new maritime corridor was eventually taken ashore. It is expected that more ships will follow in the coming days and weeks. More airdrops were carried out over Gaza today. In the north, where the hunger is most severe, this is still one of the only ways that daily aid gets in. As large crowds gathered around a landing spot, a teenage boy on the right of the screen climbs over the heads of the people in a desperate rush not to miss out. 
There are thousands of people. They dropped 20 bundles for 200,000 people. I came here to pick up a tin of beans, a packet of pasta, a kilogram of rice for my children, but I left empty-handed. In Gaza, hopes for another ceasefire have given way to a daily struggle just to eat. With negotiation talks progressing on the one hand and Israel getting ready for a new phase of fighting on the other, it's unclear what direction this war will take next and what their fate will be. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Voters in Russia are heading to the polls in a three-day presidential election that is certainly expected to extend Vladimir Putin's rule by six more years. He is standing virtually unchallenged following the death of his biggest rival, Alexei Navalny, in an Arctic prison. But there have been some signs of dissent, with protests and polling stations and some ballots set on fire, as Sky's Diana Magni reports. Long queues outside polling stations on day one of three, an electoral foregone conclusion. Because when polls close, the president will remain Vladimir Putin, no matter the other names on the ballot papers. Such events are unfolding now. Of course, I want to make my own choice and support our commander-in-chief. I decided to vote for the communists, for Haritonov, because I want some small changes and some more justice in our society. Yes, I am for Putin, because we need stability, definitely. We already know what to expect from this man, from the president. And this time it is not just in Russia or in embassies abroad where people are voting, but on Ukrainian soil too. In the territories which Russia now occupies two years into this war. Here, a polling station in Mariupol, a pro-Russian view because those who don't feel this way would not dare to speak out. Since we are a new region that joined Russia, it was important in our life to vote and choose our president of our Russia. Vladimir Putin voted online, electronic voting a new feature in presidential polls. His political nemesis, Alexei Navalny, the one man who might have challenged him, is dead. His final call from jail was for people to come to the polling stations at noon this Sunday to show that they don't agree. Denis Sakharov wants to go. He feels the role of those who oppose this regime now is to keep the focus on all those that remain behind bars. The whole concept of Russian politics can be described as necropolitics because it's all about death and about survival. We wait for Putin to die. We look at political prisoners being killed. But I think we need to think about the living and people who are alive and fixate on them, on those who we can still save, like Yashin Karamurza and all the political prisoners, because they are still alive and they are in grave danger. <laughs> Protest is manifesting itself already in different ways. Arson at one polling station. A Molotov cocktail outside another. Green dye poured into ballot boxes to spoil the votes. A febrile atmosphere in a country at war. And in Belgorod, right on Russia's border with Ukraine, more shelling from the Ukrainian side and more armed incursions from that way too. Kievsky. The Nazi Kyiv regime is trying to carry out a number of demonstratively criminal armed attacks with the aim of disrupting the voting process and intimidating people in the regions bordering Ukraine. This primarily involves striking civilian settlements on Russian territory. But who can blame Ukraine for wanting to strike back when this is the destruction that Russia continues to wreak on their homes, scores killed in Odessa this Friday? The man responsible far away in the Kremlin, determined not to stop. Diana Magne, Sky News. Uh, now, Sky News understands the Conservatives are in talks with their party donor, Frank Hester, about an additional £5 million donation. The party is already under pressure to return £10 million after Mr Hester was reported to have made racist comments about the MP Diane Abbott. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the party will declare any donations when the time is right. Our political correspondent, Matt Thompson, reports. We've got a whole shot there. Yeah. 
As the Prime Minister and Chancellor tried their hand behind the camera in Sunderland today, the focus remained firmly on a row over donations to their party. Rumours swirled about a further £5 million donation from controversial businessman Frank Hester, on top of the £10 million already declared. The Chancellor, though, was tight-lipped. We absolutely are transparent. Uh, we follow all the rules, the regulations. We believe in that transparency. When the time is right, we will declare any, any donations that we've received recently. Hester caused outrage when The Guardian reported allegedly racist comments he made at a meeting in 2019. The subject of those comments was suspended Labour MP Diane Abbott, who, Hester reportedly said, made him want to hate all black women. That led to calls for the Conservatives to hand back his donation. But far from returning the money, Sky News understands that the Conservative Party is still in talks to receive another £5 million from Mr Hester. Contrary to earlier reports, that money has not yet been handed over. If that's the case, it offers one possible explanation for the party's reluctance to brand his comments racist. Uh, comments about Diana Abbott this week. Labour were quick to jump at the latest revelations. Frank Hester's comments about Diane Abbott were racist, they were misogynistic. Comments like that have absolutely no place in our society. And to learn that on top of the £10 million that he's already given to the Conservatives, it looks like there's a further £5 million, frankly, I think is appalling. They should give that money uh, back. <laughs> Out on the campaign trail, Lib Dem leader Ed Davey was keen to bring up the election, or lack of it. Well, first of all, we're very disappointed that it's not going to be election on May the 2nd. And I think anyone in the election who receives a leaflet from the Conservatives should throw it in the bin because they know it was paid for by someone who asked, who said in, in a conversation that an MP should be shot. That is a complete disgrace. <laughs> Labour sent a brood of chickens to Westminster to tease the Prime Minister for not calling an election. But who knows, with more donations in the pipeline, a delay might just allow the Conservatives to get more bang for their buck. Matthew Thompson, Sky News. Ah, well, if you scan the QR code on screen right now, you can listen to the latest episode of our new podcast, Electoral Dysfunction. Each week, our political editor, Beth Rigby, Labour's Jess Phillips and the Conservatives' Ruth Davidson unravel the spin in politics. This week, guess what? They've been discussing the row over the Tory donor, Frank Hester, and his comments, and, of course, Lee Anderson's defection to reform. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, now, a section of the M25 is being closed in both directions across all lanes for the first time in the motorway's history. And there have been anxious calls of Carmageddon and fears of gridlock through Surrey. An estimated 6,000 vehicles an hour will be funnelled off at junctions 10 and 11 and then onto single carriageway local A roads. The aim is to reduce congestion and collisions on this hotspot, which is the worst on the UK's busiest motorway. But I'm afraid the closure is set to disrupt travellers for Heathrow and Gatwick airports, even though only a small section of the motorway will be closed off. So guys, Sadia Chowdhury is there. She joins us now. Um, Sadia, just explain exactly what is going to happen as the clock ticks over from 8.59 to 9pm. behind me, the M25, this section of it is going to close at 9 o'clock tonight and it is unprecedented because never in its history has it closed like this for an entire weekend. So where I'm standing, just to give you an indication, that is Junction 11 down there, I don't know if you can see, but uh, we can just about make the slip right out. And then uh, eastwards that way is Junction 10. So Heathrow Airport is about 11 miles uh, to my right and Gatwick Airport is about 32 miles-ish to my left. So it's a really important part of the M25 that is closing uh, and it's shutting for, uh, on, in both directions uh, right the way until Monday morning and as I say it's never been done before. Now for the locals they're, uh, they're, they're treating this like a pandemic, they're preparing like a pandemic. They're, they've done their shopping, many of the people that we spoke to today have done their shopping, they're planning to lock down for the weekend because 
all of the diversions are going to take place in and around these roads. And these are single carriageways, so it's quite a dramatic turn. Because if you see this road now, you can see how many lanes there are. Uh, and it's flea-flowing traffic. It's actually, it looks really nice, actually. The M25 isn't always like this. But once you cram all of that into the small lanes or into these single carriageways, it can be sort of nose-to-tail traffic. And that's what the locals around here today have been worried about. They're saying that they won't be able to leave their homes. They had plans. They've had to cancel all of that. Some, some women who are pregnant are worried about how they'll get to the hospital in time if they go into labour. So all sorts of concerns there. Also for the drivers, it means an extra, you know, five hours, up to five hours on the road. So generally the, the, the advice has been if you're planning to travel this weekend, unless it's absolutely urgent, try to avoid the, the, this area because there are delays of up to five hours for drivers. And as you said, the airports, Heathrow and uh, Gatwick passengers travelling to those places or in between even, uh, they face some severe delays. Sadia, thanks very much indeed. And we'll be back to Sadia throughout the evening. Now, Prince William and Prince Harry, they avoided seeing each other at a memorial event for their late mother last night, fueling more speculation of the rift between them. The Duke of Cambridge attended the event at the Science Museum in London in person. His brother appeared via video link from California after his brother had left. All this as the Duchess of Sussex returns to Instagram to launch a new business venture. Here's our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock. Every year we come across the most incredible leaders in tech. They say timing is everything. And on one day, three appearances from the Sussexes. You won! <laughs> Announcing online their Archwell Foundation Civil Rights Award, complete with a $100,000 prize. And for Harry, another award ceremony. This one remembering Princess Diana. Thank you very much for inspiring so many others and, and at the same time protecting uh, my mother's legacy. I really appreciate that. And Tessie, again, well done on this fantastic group of individuals. Harry waited until William had left before joining the winners by video. <laughs> Even virtually, the two brothers keeping their distance. I wish you bluebirds. And from Meghan, a lifestyle launch. You can just make her out whisking in the kitchen. And then a kiss. With the website and Instagram account American Riviera Orchard. No details yet, but the US trademark registration lists jams, jellies, tableware and cookbooks. It is her recipe for the future. She's been here before, though, with her blog, The Tig. It stopped when she started seeing Harry. Similar concerns, now she's cashing in on royal connections. With the new website, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see Meghan becoming potentially the new Martha Stewart. One brand expert who's worked with Meghan says it could make millions. Look at the king. He has Dutchy originals, you know. People all have these different brands, and that's jams and it's biscuits. You know, I think Meghan's allowed to have... Uh, a bit of her lifestyle that be, people can buy into. I think she'll always be open to criticism and people will criticise this, but I think the fact is it's pretty authentic. The lifestyle landscape's full of famous faces. Gwyneth Paltrow defied her critics but told Sky News it wasn't easy. It's actually funny at this point, you know, when I look back and I think about how mean people were about, like, you know, a number of things. I think there is maybe a satisfaction um, to know that, you know, not not to be glib, but just to know that I was on to something, my instincts were right. Meghan and Harry hoping their instincts are right as they rebrand into a lucrative but risky industry. Laura Bundock, Sky News. A couple of the other stories making headlines today and detectives investigating a funeral directors in Hull say they believe they've identified all 35 bodies removed from the premises. Two people arrested on suspicion of prevention of a lawful and decent burial have subsequently been bailed. The 46-year-old man and 23-year-old woman were also arrested on suspicion of fraud by false representation and fraud by abuse of possession. Boeing has told airlines to check switches on, cock on cockpit seats of its 787 Dreamliner planes. It follows an incident this week where dozens of people on a LATAM Airlines flight from Sydney to Auckland were injured when the plane fell sharply, throwing passengers around the cabin. Story of the week this. A quarter-final in the Indian Wells tennis tournament in Palm Spring was brought to a halt 
by a giant swarm of bees. Uh, the man you can see there, world number two Carlos Alcaraz, was stung on the forehead before play was halted for nearly two hours. But not all heroes wear capes. Lance Davis, the owner of Killer Bee Live Removal, happened to be in the area and popped by with, as you can see, his specialist bee vacuum cleaner to clear the court. He is going to be, I cannot believe I'm about to say this, he is a guest on the show a little later here on Friday night. Where else are you going to get an interview with the beekeeper at the, at the heart of the story of the week? Nowhere else but here. Uh, time for us to introduce our panel tonight with us for the next couple of hours. Uh, Private Eyes, Richard Brooks, and the comedian and virologist, really. Great to have you both here. Um, are, are you a big fan of beekeeping, bees, Lance, the hero? Do you know what? I follow someone else on social media and she gets called to remove bees from tricky situations. Is she the one that speaks in the really slow and calming voice as yes. she is covered in bees? Covered in bees and she just scoops them out and they kind of, and then she goes, I found the queen. I'm like, how did you find... I can't, how did you tell? She's amazing. It's so, remarkable yeah. stuff, but I have to admit, if I'm going anywhere near the hive, I'm going fully hazmat yourself, Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm the sort who tips the picnic table over when one comes <laughs> along in the summer. So, yeah, I wouldn't have been good. I would have been less cool than Al, whatever his name Al, 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 Yeah, exactly. You know. Carlos, I mean, let's just still call him Carlos. Yeah, 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 yeah. He dealt with it pretty well, but he eventually legged it. Didn't yeah, he? I'd have done that 100%. straight off. But did he win the quarterfinal? <laughs> I have to admit, I don't know. But handily, we have sport coming up at quarter two, so you can stay tuned for go. that. Uh, guys, just pause there for a second. Uh, coming up next, I think you can probably guess which story we're going to begin with. Uh, another difficult week for the Conservative Party as it wrestles with a decision whether to accept yet more money from a donor who used racist remarks about the MP Diane Abbott. I will also be discussing this, Brand Sussex getting another reboot, uh, but will it do anything to end the royal rift that continued with separate appearances from William and Harry at an event honouring their late mother? I think there's two reasons. One is Major League Cricket, which was a league that started last year, and that is T20. And the knock-on effect of that is America's one of the hosts of the T20 World Cup. And that's going to see America involved, but also India-Pakistan, one of the fiercest rivalries in cricket. And that takes place in New York. And T20 is fast. It's furious. It's all action. And it's attracting big crowds in new stadiums or stadiums also that are still being built, including in Los Angeles. And the stadiums are being packed because the tickets are affordable, because there's a number of South Asian expats in particular in the United States of America that are packing those stadiums out. And then because it's fast and furious and all action, we're getting a lot of baseball fans attending as well because they see the crossover but unlike in baseball, which drags on for three and a half hours and sometimes doesn't even have a home run, there's a six every other minute in this T20 format. And I think a lot of the baseball fans are enjoying that. In the United States of America, the streaming hasn't traditionally always been conducive in terms of when you want to get up and you're working hours. But a lot of those that live in America, and we should say Canada as well, are starting to realise from highlights and from social media in particular when they see maybe a big six and they think, wow, that's interesting, and suddenly they watch it again and again, they look up the rules and then they realise maybe there's a stadium down the road. These new Major League Cricket teams are on both coasts and centrally as well. You've got Los Angeles, you've got New York, you've got San Francisco, you've got Seattle, you've got Texas, and you've got Washington. So maybe what you see online prompts people to go with their families as well because the stadiums are very accessible and the tickets compared to baseball, for example, are very cheap.
welcome back. Now, it has been a week of backfires and blunders, best laid plans which blew up in the faces of those making them. The House of Windsor is grappling with the onslaught of rumours and conspiracy theories caused in part uh, by, the, uh, by their own uh, making after news agencies killed that royal family photograph edited by the Princess of Wales herself. But we are going to start in Westminster, where there are serious questions now over Rishi Sunak's leadership, if there weren't before, in the wake of his late response to the racist comments, let's call them what they are, made about Diane Abbott by one of the Tories' largest donors, Frank Hester. Here's a quick reminder. A major Conservative Party donor has apologised over comments he made that looking at Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women. Figures from the electoral Commission show Frank Hester donated £10 million to the Tories last year. I don't think what he was saying was a gender-based or a race-based uh, comment, but it was clearly inappropriate. He has apologised, and I think uh, we need to move on from that. That makes me hate black women. I don't see how th those remarks aren't sexist or racist. I don't, I don't understand that. The Prime Minister called those comments racist and wrong. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language? As I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments and that remorse should be accepted. The woman at the heart of this story tried and tried and tried to have her say in the Commons, rising 46 times through PMQs, trying to get her own question. Uh, Richard and Rhea are here to give us their thoughts on this story. And, and look, I don't hear who kicks this off, but I know, I know the topic I want to start on. These comments, which it took until I think it was Tuesday evening into Wednesday for the government to describe as racist. It, it was obviously racist from the very beginning. And the only reason they did so late on Tuesday and into Wednesday was because it took a black member of the cabinet, Kemi Badenoch, to stand up and say, do you know what? I think this is racist as well. What on earth has been going on this week? Rhea, do you want to start, Richard? Where? Well, uh, I think uh, it's money, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there's 10 million quid gone into the Tory coffers mm. from uh, Frank Hester's company uh, and, and from him personally. That's the helicopter ride uh, for Rishi Sunak. 16 grand, you know, that's nice. And there's another 5 million on the table, you know, so that money talks and it talks more loudly than their conscience until the political calculation shifts to, yeah. right, we've got to, you know, we've got to admit it's racist. But... Mm. You know, not to do so in a week that you're also uh, defining extremism, telling people what extremism means, mm. not to be able to say that the comments we just heard there aren't racist mm -hmm. is absurd. Mm. None of which is to say... that Because, of course, the, the, the other issue that is going on in parallel is whether or not the Labour Party returns the whip to, to Diane Abbott. And, you know, as we mentioned on the podcast this week, you know, Diane Abbott lost the whip because she said things which either came very close to being racist or anti-Semitic or actually, in fact, were. Well, this is where we find out that it depends... It's not just what's said, but who says it. Mm. Um, and we're living right now in, through a period of politics where you're either with us or you're against us. And I think we've seen that very clearly in what you said, in the extremist definition mm -hmm. that, that Michael Gove has just brought out, but also in the fact that, well, Hester's with us. So if he says things and apologises, then he means it and he gets to stay where he is. But if, if Diane Abbott says something... And that apologizes. We did, And apologises and, we, and we retracts it and distances herself from it, well, that's still not enough. And mm. it's been proven even, what is it, over a year later, still not to be enough. And, and also another with us or against us. We see that in the fact that, that even Keir Starmer didn't say, hey, maybe we should let her speak. Mm. They all, they, Although Keir Starmer did go straight to the back benches to speak to her immediately after Peter Afterwards, Cusick finished. Afterwards, but I, I'm sorry. It's not, but it's not in his gift to, for the Speaker to, to, to choose Diane Abbott, I'm afraid. It is. No, it's not, it's not in Keir's, but it yeah. is in the speaker's. Yeah, but Keir yeah. could have certainly have shown her a little more support, I think. I think he had an opportunity there. Mm, okay, fair enough. He, he was he... overheard afterwards talking to her. Mm. And uh, he said, is there anything we can do? She said, you can give the whip back. And he wouldn't answer that. Mm. He said, talk to me if... Yeah, well, wouldn't, but if wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be very difficult for them to do so, particularly now, and he said it on Wednesday mm. during Prime Minister's questions, you know, you're run by your party, I've changed mine. I mean, yeah. for, for Diane Abbott to come back and she still believes that Jeremy Corbyn has nothing to apologise for, that Jeremy Corbyn has, should have the whip reinstated as well. I mean, if he does give her back the whip, it's just, you know, she, he, he then becomes a hostage to fortune to the next time that Diane Abbott says something. But then there are plenty of people that, in, that are still in the party that have said similar things 
mm. about Diane Abbott that Hester said, and he hasn't sanctioned them either. So mm. whether or not, I mean, maybe he can't give the whip back under under the current circumstances, but he can certainly do, I think, what we call a lot of more soft politics around the issue to, yeah. to show where he actually stands. But he's still being a little bit wishy-washy in terms yeah. of trying not to get anything dirty. Yeah, and of he course, could be, and he, he could be clear. Well. He could be clear with Diane Abbott. He mm -hmm. could say, here's what you have to do. Here's mm -hmm. how you have to retract and mm -hmm. show contrition what you said for your possibly anti-Semitic remarks. But he's not doing that. He's letting it... He's just letting it sit there, hoping that the, you know, the controversy doesn't get to him. Indeed, and, and, and let's not forget the fact they're all in the same plague pit. The Ford report pointed out the hierarchy of racism within the, within the party as well. But I, I want to move us on to, to that, 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 that redefinition of extremism that took place this way. Uh, Michael Gove was the uh, Cabinet Minister response. We, uh, here's a little bit, I think, from him uh, announcing this in the Commons. The time has come for us all to stand together, to combat the forces of division and to beat this poison. The liberties that we hold dear, and indeed the democratic principles we're all sent here to uphold, require us to counter and challenge the extremists who seek to intimidate, to coerce and to divide. We have to be clear-eyed about the threat we face, precise about where that threat comes from and rigorous in defending our democracy. I, I, I really do urge people, if they haven't really been following this story, to go and listen to our podcast on it this week, because I don't think people fully understand the significance of what Michael Gove was, was announcing this week. He has, he has redefined extremism. There is going to be a list on which uh, Leveling Up Secretary and the Home Secretary will be the ultimate arbiters of who appears on it. They've been working on this for ages, and yet there is no list. There is no list as yet, and I'm, I'm, I feel really quite uncomfortable about it. Richard, how are you with it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just so rich for a government like this to be <laughs> lecturing us on what extremism is and to be defined. If you look at the definition, they're talking about um, uh, undermining liberal parliamentary democracy, you know, which just they invites us the to... illegally look... prorogued parliament. Exactly. Right? Unlawfully, We look say. at 14 years of this government. Mm -hmm. You know, they lied to us over Brexit. They, as you say, they illegally prorogued parliament. They've disenfranchised lots of uh, lower-income people with, with conditions on voting. It goes on and on and on. You know, this government has been in, a, in a, you know, on its own definition, perhaps the most extremist government for a long time. Mm. I think, that's, I think that's the biggest irony of the situation, is if you just take the definition as it now stands, as Gove has redefined it, it could apply to current government. Mm. It, you could say, actually, yeah. the Tory party as it currently stands very much fits within that definition. What bothers me the most is the inclusion of the word intolerance. Well, but this because is how thing. do you define that? Well, exactly that, because this is not, there's, there, you know, we're not talking about prescription. We're not talking about groups, um, you know, terrorist groups, for example. We are talking about groups which mm. have committed no crimes mm. under the laws as it's necessarily. I mean, there may well be some, some who do eventually, but, you know, they do not have to be acting illegally to be counted as extremists. And, it, and again, I just, I, 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 find, I, I find myself feeling quite uncomfortable about a process by which politicians get to say who is and who isn't, and there isn't a, there isn't a right of appeal to it. I think it's also very dangerous to say you do not have access to your government mm. if we decide that you're on this list. Yeah. They said you don't have access to government funding or access to your local politicians, which directly undermines democracy. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is you yeah, undermining yeah. it with but, your own definition. But, but, there's there's also is, but there, is the, there is the point, though, isn't there? That, you know, we have seen MPs losing their lives. We have seen yeah. MPs stabbed. We have seen MPs shot. And, you know, there can't be an MP in the House of Commons at the moment who does not have an inbox full. Yeah. of bio. There's no doubt, and that's a symptom of the rising levels of extremism, and that's why it's got to be addressed properly. That doesn't mean that a government with no great moral authority can come along and define it. Mm. You know, it doesn't... Healthy discussion doesn't work like that. Mm. It's a bit like the approach to Rwanda, where they, you know, judges and anybody who looks carefully at the country says it's not a safe country. Enemy but the government state. defines it as a safe country. Yeah. You can kind of... They're trying to adjust reality, and that, that you know... That loses people's confidence. Mm. Guys, we are going to uh, pause there, but we do have plenty more uh, coming up, including can we expect to know about what is actually going on in the royal family, plus the delicate matter of disgusting Snowden. Stay with you.
Welcome back. Uh, the Princess of Wales, remember her? Well, she's not been seen in public since Christmas as she recovers from abdominal surgery. But what happens when the most photographed woman in the world stops being photographed? It seems Kate Middleton never makes any gaffes in public or in private. But now an unforced error by the Princess, editing her own photo has unleashed a Pandora's box of crackpot theories and perhaps more importantly, has broken the trust between what the, House, between what the House of Windsor tells us is true about their lives. Let's bring uh, Rian Richard in uh, at this point. Um, I mean, it's, it, it is a fascinating one, this. And, and whilst we're talking, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at the, at the original image. But, but first and foremost, where do you both stand on Catherine using Photoshop or whatever to edit an image and then putting it out. Sorry, did you just say you have the original image? Do you know how many no, people no, no, are no, looking no, sorry, for the original no, no, no. image? We've got, we've, got the, we've got the image. Oh, I'll <laughs> tell you that. Oh. oh, I got Which excited is, there. I know. Um, but what, but is, there, is there something wrong with this? What, what is wrong with it? I mean, Given that every Instagram account that exactly, I ever go on these days does is it. filtered to... I was about to swear, but filtered an awful lot. In fact, I think some phones just have an automatic filter... Because I, I notice I look better on some people's phones than mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Gwyneth Paltrow was looking excellent on that Zoom call that she was recorded on earlier oh, on as oh, well. Oh, no, I always push the Zoom filters to, to max uh, on that one. That's, that's a known. But it, she's doing what everybody else does. They go mm. in and, and, they, and they, they fiddle a bit with this and they fiddle a bit with that. I think, I think what gets us is it was a little strange. Like, what, was, what could have been so wrong about a cuff of a sleeve, or mm. what was his hand before? I mean, I think that's... And I also have seen a lot of articles where people have said, oh, her zip doesn't match up, and I think people are finding more edits than she actually probably mm. did. I mean, yeah. Richard, I mean, the, 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 the private eye uh, front cover is, I have to admit, pretty good on this, and we'll bring yeah. that up in just a second. But mm. but I, I suppose that... <laughs> it's fantastic. Andrew, just, just poking out there at the back. I, I, I suppose... you concentrate though... really hard, you can spot what we've done. <laughs> just, just, a little, just a little bit. But, but I suppose... The problem is this: that that Catherine gave these photos not just out on her mm. social media account, but she gave them to news agencies, Associated Press, Reuters, Press Association, and so on, which they then you they then sent that image out to the rest of the world. Their assumption would have been this was an undoctored image, which is why they've issued the kill, uh, kill notice. Yeah, it's it's sort of a ham-fisted attempt to sort of fairly, in many ways, old-school royal uh, media manipulation. Mm. You know, presented. They've always presented images which, uh, you know, are not consistent with what's really going on mm. behind the scenes. Um, but here, you know, they've, they've done it in a way that can be found out. It's almost like technology has mm. caught them out uh, mm. because they've been pretty, pretty hopeless at it. I mean, not that I'd be any better, but, you know, they've not been clear that they're presenting mm. an altered image. They presented it as a traditional royal photograph, yep. Yep. which is, you know, genuine. Um, and it isn't, so they've looked shifty. Yeah. And, and that's so, kind of naive. It's kind of naive to think that they wouldn't get caught out. But, but, yeah, sorry, shifty, I, I mean, shifty, it, it's a picture of a woman and her three kids, and we can tell that, the, that it is her and her three kids. Yeah. So, I mean, it, what, what are we being deceived? Just, just to put it out there, like, what do we feel is missing. Well, Extra but, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely... I mean, this is why we all want the original image. Well, I, 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 I suppose because when, when you, you, you are handed a photo as a news agency by a member of the royal yes. family, you believe that it has been unmanipulated and you've put it out in, the, in that fashion. I, I do wonder, though, about the, the, the kind of the, the sneering from sources close to those who live on the opposite mm. side of the, of the Atlantic is just a little bit misplaced. I mean, I remember that... I think it was what, whether it was a birthday card or a Christmas card, um, Harry and Meghan and their baby right at the front of the camera and... and Megan pulling off the rare feat of having her face perfectly in focus, but her neck and the rest of her body somehow merging into the background. I mean, you know, like, yeah, like he was without sin, cast the first stone. Oh, they, I, I believe Harry and Meghan added an entire tree into one of their <laughs> yes. photos. So it's, it's something that they do. I think Kate's real sin here was giving it to official channels. If she mm. just left it on her Instagram, I yeah. don't think anyone yeah. has the right to, to point mm. any fingers. I think it's the fact that they presented it as an official photo. But it, it does call into question every other photo, because she takes a lot of the photos of the family. Yes, yes yeah. she does. And, 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 she, and she's, you know, an amateur photographer. And, and now everybody's going to wonder what else. But mm. I, I guess the question is, why now? Well, it, well, isn't part of it the ongoing psychodrama at the heart of the House of Windsor that Harry and William don't get on, and therefore we are led to believe that their partners could, could 
could never get on ever again. But, I mean, I do have to pick up on the fact that whilst we did see William and Harry speaking at the same event the other day, one by video link, one in person, you know, whilst that was going on, Art, you know, Megan launches her new business at the same time, which is, which is what it's... You were looking at this earlier. It's selling... It it's selling jam and flans and edible oils or something. I don't know. Well, it's it's not candles, <laughs> so that's... Yeah, yeah, thing. good. I'm uh, not sure the dragons would go for it. <laughs> no, not mean, entirely. It's a pretty odd combination. No. What, what, do you, what do you make of the name, though? What is it? Ameri American Riviera America Orchard. American Riviera Orchard. And I think a lot of people, if they don't know better, will think Ugly Betty got married. Um, <laughs> like, American Riviera Orchard? No, that's America Ferreira. Too. Yeah, that's right. That's but right. it... I mean... I, you know what, if this is her business and she's going to launch a business and become a businesswoman and, and, and make her money that way, I applaud her because I think that's what they should have done in the first place is if they yeah. didn't want to stay with the royal family, they should have gone off and gotten jobs, much like his cousins. His cousins have always worked mm -hmm. and then occasionally popped in and done, a, you know, an official job mm -hmm. for the firm. So if this is her starting a business and this is going to feed her children and, and pay for their security power to them. I think the timing of it was suspicious and that's what, that's mm. more, why are you doing that on the same day as, as the Princess Diana Awards? I don't, anyway, don't know about that. I just want to flag up the fact that I again wanted this story to be called Watergate because I think it's a fantastic name for the, for, for the story. Watergate, Kate, see what I did they, there? They, they used it. Oh, they did? Yeah. They did, oh, they under, did. Oh, under, under the photo. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Excellent. Do you know what? We'll move on to another story <laughs> uh, and this is one that is that. very close to my heart, I have to say. Uh, just how difficult is it to bake a potato. Mm. Uh, this week, head teacher Jason Ashley from Redbridge Community School in Southampton sent a letter to parents for the unacceptable school dinners being served to their children. I mean, if you've seen the pictures, you, you will agree with that. I mean, he called out the caterers specifically for the uh, poor quality of their food. I mean, Richard, to, to you on this one, I have to admit, I was confused by the story. And we're looking at the, the, yeah. the, the wonderful fair on offer. And you can understand why the head teacher was kicking off. But at the same time, I couldn't understand because presumably, you know, the head teacher has responsibility for this. However, it turns out it's a PFI school, something which, of course, Private Eye has done an awful lot of work on over the years. Yeah, the, these, this is a way of uh, getting infrastructure like school buildings, like hospitals, um, under contracts with private companies that last for two or three decades. Um, the idea is that they get to they pay for it up front and you pay them over 20 or 30 years, or the taxpayer does, mm. for the services. Mm. Uh, the trouble is that they're expensive and they come with um, contracts that you're locked into and you can't choose, you know, so the headmaster... And these are contracts can... lasting decades. Exactly, yeah. 30 years, usually. Uh, so the headmaster you've just mentioned, he can't decide he wants to go to another catering company. He's stuck with his company, Chartwells, who you might remember from three years ago were in trouble when Marcus Rashford pointed out mm -hmm. kind of the, the pathetic portions that they, they were giving children. Uh, so it's not a first time, uh, but the, the schools have to use this company. Uh, they have to make a lot of money for their shareholders. This company, mm -hmm. Chartwell, is part of a big group called Compass, which makes nearly £2 billion a year in profits. You know, you can get a few getting a few bags of decent vegetables for that. You certainly um, can. And um, I will say at this point, we, we have, of course, had a, had a you know, reply from the company. They have said sorry. Uh, a spokesman for Chartwell said this. Uh, we apologise that in this instance, our usual level of service has fallen below the high standards we demand. Uh, we are... Working, or sorry, we are committed to working in collaboration with the school and are implementing an immediate action plan to rectify um, these issues. I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I because I, I lived up the road from my school. I, I never had, I never had school lunches, and actually was lucky enough you know, for most of the time. You know, my mum, mum actually would pop back from her work at lunchtime. But you know, you you look back on what where school food was yeah. forty years ago and where it is supposed to be now, and you look at those pictures, and it turns your stomach, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think. It's they, they, they pay, the government pays £2.35 per free school meal. Mm. That was not worth £2.35, that picture that we saw. So, you know, and, and the fact that you said they're making £2 billion in profit. If you put profit against children's health, what's going to lose? And it's mm. always going to be the children that are going to lose yeah. because they have no, there's no client to complain. And mm. as we're seeing here, we're trying to go, oh, it's fallen below the standards that we expect. You're only doing something, and probably only with that school because it's been brought to mm. public attention. But how many other schools are suffering yeah. and are not going to get this level of publicity? Well, Lee Anderson, you know, formerly Conservative MP, you know, who famously said, you can make yourself food for 30p. I mean, if he's got yeah. so, so much time on his hands, yeah. <laughs> perhaps we should send uh, Lee Anderson down. But look, 
but, but, but it boils back to the same thing. We've had Jamie Oliver doing his campaigns. We've had you know, local authorities doing their campaigns. You know, if, your kids, if your kids are not eating properly yeah. when they're at school, I mean, it's fundamental to their education. Well, if, they've got, if their bellies are empty or they're not eating properly decent quality food, why on earth would you expect them to be excelling at their the, academics? This is the problem that the cost of school dinners is treated as a cost mm. when it's actually uh, an investment. Yeah. You know, you, you improve kids' education, we know that. Mm. Um, there was an interesting comment I heard yesterday from a former Education Secretary, Justine Greening, and said that, you know, if this was money being spent on artificial intelligence, we'd call it an investment. Uh, yeah. It's actually spending... It's on, it's on, you know, real development of children. Mm. Um, but nobody looks at it that way because, um, you know, the, the spending on education per capita has fallen for a decade and a half or so. Uh, and because the schools are locked into these uh, contracts with companies that are creaming off profits and they're operating in schools that can't invest in decent, uh, you know, catering facilities, um, they're paring down costs the whole time. And rather than looking at it as a long term programme, um, guys, we're going to have to, to leave it there. Much, much more from you coming up in the 8 o'clock hour. Uh, for us, though, looking ahead to the sport, Teddy will be here uh, talking about the final weekend of the Six Nations. Who's going to win? We won't be telling you next. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News' West of England correspondent. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. Welcome back. It is, of course, the final weekend of the Six Nations Championship. The title race is still alive. Scotland can do England a favour by beating Ireland in Dublin, which would also see the Scottish clinch the Triple Crown. Wales, well, they're hoping to avoid the wooden spoon when they play Italy in what is going to be George North's final game legend. Uh, Teddy from Sky Sports News is back with us. Good to see you. Good to see you. Of course, as, as we both know, the only match that is of any importance in the Six Nations is the Calcutta Cup, and we sorted that one out. Fair enough. No, no, yeah, no. But three, Scotland beat England. The 3D chess that we need to do to work out who could, Basically, anyone, almost anyone could win it. It's, it's really hard for your brain to try and compute it. We know that Ireland can't win the Grand Slam after mm. they lost at Twickenham last week, but they are the big favourites. They need to either draw 
or win against Scotland. They're guaranteed to take the title again. Mm. But everyone else can. England can do it, depending on permutations. Scotland can do it if they beat Ireland. And then uh, France beat England, but France don't win by a bonus point against England. So don't score four tries in that one. So the chance that France or, or, um, or Scotland could win it as well. So it's all up in the air. The thing is, Ireland are big favourites. I think England the second favourites. So yeah. it comes Scotland and France probably in that order. Yeah, I th I do you know what? I'm, I'm not going to challenge given what Scotland did last weekend uh, with the Italians. So let's 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 talk about something a bit a little bit more a little bit more positive. Mm. Yeah, George North, yeah, coming to the end of his career and, and an absolute legend of the game, cracking player. Brilliant, yeah. 47 caps, he's second in the all-time list. I don't think he'll beat Shane Williams because no. he's on 58, so he's got 11 to go. But you just wonder, uh, with this match against Italy, he says he'll live the dream one more time. And you think they've never finished bottom or haven't finished bottom since 2003 in George North's era, that he could sign off back in the team after being dropped last week for his final game before he moves to Provence. Maybe, what do you think, a hat-trick to get to 50 maybe would be a, a fitting nice. send-off. But all the tries... And just such a young player, 18, yeah. scoring two tries on his debut. First Wales player to 50, first world player to 100 caps. And it's a, in a way, it's a bit of a surprise. He's 31, he's still going strong. But you expect some uh, emotional scenes in, in Cardiff tomorrow. But I suppose the main thing from the Welsh fans' perspective is to get that, get that win over Italy. I think it would be nice, you were saying before, that for Italy not to finish bottom for the first time since 2015 would be good. It would be, it would be wonderful for them. Anyway, there's lots more sport around this weekend. Teddy, why don't you take that away? Absolutely. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Every week across the UK, 85% of school-age students take part in approximately an hour of sport a week. Organised grassroots sport has lower numbers, but it translates to millions of girls and boys between the age of 7 and 20 playing sport. But there is a problem, a big problem. Without doubt, every year we seem to be seeing more and more young people coming through with significant knee injuries, and primarily we're talking about ACL ruptures. The numbers are staggering and extremely worrying. For every one person that was having an ACL reconstruction in uh, the late 90s, there's now 29 children having those surgeries. So the number of injuries is without a doubt 29 fold yeah evidence of a problem comes from multiple sources other surgeons and doctors are waving a warning flag we increase by 29 folds amount of operation devastating injuries that are that, that can cause complete change of the life trajectory and early risk of arthritis people are committing to uh, one or two sports at most at the moment, uh, if they are going to be part of the local community. And they, they spend less time developing other skills that will be naturally developed uh, when they are participating in multiple sports. They're on screens, sedentary, and then suddenly they're in very organised, highly competitive sports environments. There's some evidence about, you know, sports specialisation. So if you have a a child who's very good at one sport, they might be pushed down that kind of route and only play that sport. Probably the second biggest reason is that there's a huge knowledge gap in the UK about the importance of injury prevention programmes and the importance of warming up kids. Mm -hmm. There's this myth in grassroots sport that kids don't get injured so they don't need to warm up, just you know, get off on the pitch and off you go. It couldn't be farther from the truth. You look at Australia, you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, Netherlands, Canada, all of them have started trying to put together national programmes to deliver these warm-up programmes. And in the UK, that really hasn't happened. It's embarrassing to say that we're from the UK. We are so behind the rest of the world. Female footballers are six times more at risk of an ACL injury, while research and this Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Teddy, thank you. Uh, sport done. Time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. To fly. Sponsored by Qatar Airways.
And the weather remains mild but unsettled this weekend, with further showers or longer spells of rain. Thicker cloud over parts of the east will bring some drizzly rain this evening, but earlier daytime showers will fizzle out, leaving most places dry. A brief ridge of high pressure overnight means the winds will ease, any lingering showers fade, and temperatures drop as the skies clear. Some fog patches are likely as, a well, as well as a widespread rural frost. A cloud will build in the southwest, bringing rain and drizzle to parts of Ireland and southwest Britain. Uh, a chilly but dry start to Saturday with a few mist and fog patches. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Stay where you are. Coming up in the next hour, we'll have the latest on the situation in Gaza as Israel approves a military operation in the city of Rafa. Hello and welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in hour two of the show, uh, our news reviewers will be returning to help with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week. Plus, the political journalist Michael Crick will hopefully explain why the Tories are discussing accepting another five million quid from a donor who made racist comments about Diane Abbott. But first, the headlines this hour. Israel rejects Hamas' latest ceasefire proposal on the day that Benjamin Netanyahu approves plans for a military operation in Rafa. But a ship carrying 20 tonnes of aid and medical supplies has finally arrived off the coast of Gaza. Protests at Russia's rubber stamp election. Polls open with Putin on course to secure power for another six years. Turmoil in the Tory party after reports that the Conservatives received another £5 million from Frank Hester, the man at the centre of the racism round. And how a swarm of bees caused a racket at the Indian Wells tennis tournament in California. Coming up, our news reviewers Richard Brooks and Ria Lena return to help me decide who's had a seven days to celebrate and who's had a week to forget. 
And it was definitely a good week to be a former Premier League manager with a love of horses, as Sir Alex Ferguson and Harry Redknapp rack up three winners between them at the Cheltenham Festival. But why has it been a torrid time for trillionaire sovereign fund holders? And what has this former Chancellor got to do with it all? Plus, in the sport, the FA Cup quarterfinals are the highlight of a busy footballing weekend. Will it be Klopp on top when Liverpool take on Manchester United? Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight, it's Friday night. Evening all, Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has downplayed chances of a truce in Gaza, calling the proposals made by Hamas unrealistic. Meanwhile, he is understood to have approved plans for a military operation in Rafa. All this as an aid ship loaded with nearly 200 tonnes of food and supplies has arrived off the coast of Gaza. Our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, has our first report. Rafa, on the Egyptian border, has become a massive refugee camp for more than a million Gazans who have fled fighting in the north. Moving them to somewhere else in Gaza ahead of a land invasion will probably take some time. But the Israeli government says it has now approved plans for that to happen. We have to see a clear and implementable plan, not only to get uh, civilians out of harm's way, but also to make sure that once out of harm's way, they're appropriately cared for with shelter, with food, with medicine, with clothing, and we've not yet seen such a plan. With Israeli forces closing in, Hamas has delivered a new ceasefire proposal to Israel and said they will now accept an initial temporary ceasefire. They had previously insisted on a permanent one and the withdrawal of all Israeli forces. The Israeli war cabinet met this afternoon and described some of Hamas's demands as unrealistic, but announced a delegation will travel to Qatar for further talks. Hamas's change in position is significant because it removes what had been one of the major obstacles to a new hostage deal. Although the Israeli government has been in public quite dismissive of it, clearly the gap between the two sides is narrowing. After three days sailing, the aid ship finally appeared off the coast of Gaza. Palestinians watched expectantly from the beaches as it came into the offing. Satellite images taken over the past few days show a temporary pier being constructed ahead of the ship's arrival. The first aid from the new maritime corridor was eventually taken ashore. It is expected that more ships will follow in the coming days and weeks. More airdrops were carried out over Gaza today. In the north, where the hunger is most severe, this is still one of the only ways that daily aid gets in. As large crowds gathered around a landing spot, a teenage boy on the right of the screen climbs over the heads of the people in a desperate rush not to miss out. There are thousands of people. They dropped 20 bundles for 200,000 people. I came here to pick up a tin of beans, a packet of pasta, a kilogram of rice for my children, but I left empty-handed. In Gaza, hopes for another ceasefire have given way to a daily struggle just to eat. With negotiation talks progressing on the one hand and Israel getting ready for a new phase of fighting on the other, it's unclear what direction this war will take next and what their fate will be. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Well, well, let's stick with the story. Uh, there has been the strongest reaction yet from the United States following Benjamin Netanyahu's approval of that Rafa plan. Our US correspondent James Matthews joins us from Washington. Uh, James, good to see you. Who's been talking? What have they been saying? Well, Joe Biden's been talking, not for the first time, Neil, and you'll remember that very stridently he spoke about an Israeli operation in Rafah amidst that number of civilians as a red line. Uh, the question would be right now, when is a red line not a red line? Certainly it doesn't seem to be one recognised by Benjamin Netanyahu, who not for the first time is testing the patience of the US president and certainly 
risking undermining his authority continually. Biden is bounced into a very difficult corner by Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and Biden, an individual who is supplying arms to him. There is this insistence uh, of his support for Israel, but that continues to be strained. Strained further today inside the, no the Oval Office, Neil Biden was meeting with the visiting uh, Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar, and he was asked about the, the Middle East situation. And he referred to a speech yesterday by Chuck Schumer, the most senior US official uh, on this side of the Atlantic, leader of the Democrats in the Senate. And he, you'll remember, said that the only way out of this is elections, effectively to get rid of Netanyahu, an individual he said, for whom political survival was more important than the best interests of Israel. Now, today, Biden has called that a good speech. It's a speech that was cleared with the White House in advance, or certainly drawn to the White House's attention. Biden was asked, well, did you agree with the, the sentiments? He wouldn't be drawn on that, but it's clear that that kind of view, uh, which is hardening here in the United States, is shared to a large degree in the White House as the Biden administration ratchets up its pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu, a pressure not nearly strong enough for many, of course. Let's listen to Admiral John Kirby. He was asked about the situation, particularly about Rafa and the civilian situation and danger there uh, about an hour ago. Let's listen. We still can't get behind a plan, and we won't get behind a plan that doesn't properly account for those million and a half refugees in Gaza who need a place to go where they can be safe from the, from the fighting. What does the United States do if uh, Benjamin Netanyahu continues to turn a deaf ear to its demands? Well, what we're hearing from U.S. officials is that they would use their the, the tools at their disposal diplomatically and practically in practical terms. They would look at placing conditions, perhaps, on the arms and the financial support that they put the way of Israel. They would, might also have a rethink at the United Nations on blocking ceasefire motions. You'll remember that the United States has used its veto several times in terms of blocking uh, a ceasefire. That may turn on its axis should the situation continue in the way it appears to be heading. James, many thanks. Voters in Russia are heading to the polls in a three-day presidential election that is certainly expected to extend Vladimir Putin's rule by six more years. He is standing virtually unchallenged following the death of his biggest political rival, Alexei Navalny, in an Arctic prison. But there have been signs of dissent with some protests, also polling stations and even some ballots set on fire, as Sky's Diana Magni reports. Long queues outside polling stations on day one of three, an electoral foregone conclusion. Because when polls close, the president will remain Vladimir Putin, no matter the other names on the ballot papers. Such events are unfolding now. Of course, I want to make my own choice and support our commander-in-chief. I decided to vote for the communists, for Haritonov, because I want some small changes and some more justice in our society. Yes, I am for Putin, because we need stability, definitely. We already know what to expect from this man, from the president. <laughs> And this time it is not just in Russia or in embassies abroad where people are voting, but on Ukrainian soil too. In the territories which Russia now occupies two years into this war. Here a polling station in Mariupol, a pro-Russian view because those who don't feel this way would not dare to speak out. Since we are a new region that joined Russia, it was important in our life to vote and choose our president of our Russia. Vladimir Putin voted online, electronic voting a new feature in presidential polls. His political nemesis, Alexei Navalny, the one man who might have challenged him, is dead. His final call from jail was for people to come to the polling stations at noon this Sunday to show that they don't agree. Denis Sakharov wants to go. 
He feels the role of those who oppose this regime now is to keep the focus on all those that remain behind bars. The whole concept of Russian politics can be described as necropolitics because it's all about death and about survival. We wait for Putin to die. We look at political prisoners being killed. But I think we need to think about the living and people who are alive and fixate on them, on those who we can still save, like Yashin Karamurza and all the political prisoners, because they are still alive and they are in grave danger. Protest is manifesting itself already in different ways. Arson at one polling station, a Molotov cocktail outside another, green dye poured into ballot boxes to spoil the votes, a febrile atmosphere in a country at war. And in Belgorod, right on Russia's border with Ukraine, more shelling from the Ukrainian side and more armed incursions from that way too. The Nazi Kyiv regime is trying to carry out a number of demonstratively criminal armed attacks with the aim of disrupting the voting process and intimidating people in the regions bordering Ukraine. This primarily involves striking civilian settlements on Russian territory. But who can blame Ukraine for wanting to strike back when this is the destruction that Russia continues to wreak on their homes, scores killed in Odessa this Friday? The man responsible far away in the Kremlin, determined not to stop. Diana Magne, Sky News. Sky News understands the Conservatives are in talks with the party donor Frank Hester about an additional £5 million donation. The party is already under pressure to return £10 million after Mr Hester was reported to have made racist comments about the MP Diane Abbott. The Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says the party will declare any donations when the time is right, our political correspondent Matt Thompson reports. As the Prime Minister and Chancellor tried their hand behind the camera in Sunderland today, the focus remained firmly on a row over donations to their party. Rumours swirled about a further £5 million donation from controversial businessman Frank Hester, on top of the £10 million already declared. The Chancellor, though, was tight-lipped. We absolutely are transparent. Uh, we follow all the rules, the regulations. We believe in that transparency. When the time is right, we will declare any, any donations that we've received recently. Hester caused outrage when The Guardian reported allegedly racist comments he made at a meeting in 2019. The subject of those comments was suspended Labour MP Diane Abbott who, Hester reportedly said, made him want to hate all black women. No, that Speaker. led to calls for the Conservatives to hand back his donation. But far from returning the money, Sky News understands that the Conservative Party is still in talks to receive another £5 million from Mr Hester. Contrary to earlier reports, that money has not yet been handed over. If that's the case, it offers one possible explanation for the party's reluctance to brand his comments racist. Uh, comments about Diana Abbott this week. Labour were quick to jump at the latest revelations. Frank Hester's comments about Diane Abbott were racist, they were misogynistic. Comments like that have absolutely no place in our society. And to learn that on top of the £10 million that he's already given to the Conservatives, it looks like there's a further £5 million, frankly, I think is appalling. They should give that money uh, back. <laughs> Out on the campaign trail, Lib Dem leader Ed Davey was keen to bring up the election, or lack of it. Well, first of all, we're very disappointed that it's not going to be election on May the 2nd. And I think anyone in the election who receives a leaflet from the Conservatives should throw it in the bin because they know it was paid for by someone who, asked, who said in, in a conversation that an MP should be shot. That is a complete disgrace. <laughs> Labour sent a brood of chickens to Westminster to tease the Prime Minister for not calling an election. But who knows? With more donations in the pipeline, a delay might just allow the Conservatives to get more bang for their buck. <laughs> Matthew Thompson, Sky News. Well, if you scan the QR code on screen right now, you can listen to the latest episode of Electoral Dysfunction. Every week, Beth Rigby, Jess Phillips and Ruth Davidson unravel the spin in politics. This week, guess what? They've been discussing the row over Frank Hester's comments and, of course, Lee Anderson's defection to the Reform Party. You can get Electoral Dysfunction wherever you get your podcasts.
Prince William and Prince Harry avoided seeing each other at a memorial event for their late mother last night, feeling more speculation of a rift between them. The Duke of Cambridge attended the event at the Science Museum in London in person, his brother, meanwhile, appearing via video link from California after his brother had left. All this as the Duchess of Sussex returns to Instagram to launch a new business venture. Here's our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock. Every year we come across the most incredible leaders in tech. They say timing is everything. And on one day, three appearances from the Sussexes. You won! <laughs> Announcing online their Archwell Foundation Civil Rights Award, complete with a $100,000 prize. And for Harry, another award ceremony, this one remembering Princess Diana. Thank you very much for inspiring so many others and, and at the same time protecting uh, my mother's legacy. I really appreciate that. And Tessie, again, well done on this fantastic group of individuals. Harry waited until William had left before joining the winners by video. <laughs> Even virtually, the two brothers keeping their distance. I wish you bluebirds. And from Meghan, a lifestyle launch. You can just make her out whisking in the kitchen. And then a kiss. With the website and Instagram account American Riviera Orchard. No details yet, but the US trademark registration lists jams, jellies, tableware and cookbooks. It is her recipe for the future. She's been here before, though, with her blog, The Tig. It stopped when she started seeing Harry. Similar concerns, now she's cashing in on royal connections. With the new website, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see Meghan becoming potentially the new Martha Stewart. One brand expert who's worked with Meghan says it could make millions. Look at the king. He has Dutchy originals. You know, people all have these different brands, and that's jams and it's biscuits. You know, I think Meghan's allowed to have... Uh, a bit of her lifestyle that be, people can buy into. I think she'll always be open to criticism and people will criticise this, but I think the fact is it's pretty authentic. The lifestyle landscape's full of famous faces. Gwyneth Paltrow defied her critics, but told Sky News it wasn't easy. It's actually funny at this point, you know, when I look back and I think about how mean people were about, like, you know, a number of things. I think there is maybe a satisfaction um, to know that, you know, not not to be glib, but just to know that I was on to something, my instincts were right. Meghan and Harry hoping their instincts are right as they rebrand into a lucrative but risky industry. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Now, a section of the M25 has been closed in both directions across all lanes for the first time in the motorway's history. And there have been anxious calls of Carmageddon and fears of gridlock through Surrey. An estimated, get this, 6,000 vehicles an hour will be funnelled off at junctions 10 and 11 and onto single carriageway local A roads. This is the best bit. The aim is to reduce congestion and collisions at this hotspot. It is actually the worst on the UK's busiest motorway. But the closure is certainly going to disrupt travellers heading to Heathrow and Gatwick airports, even though only a tiny section of the motorway will be closed off. As you can see, our news reviewers are here, Private Eyes Richard Brooks and the comedian and virologist uh, Rialina. Great to have you both back. Um, how are you guys getting home this evening? Is this going to be a problem for you? I hope not. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you I just know what? That there, As a comedian, ask. the number of times you leave a gig at 11 o'clock at night mm. anywhere in the country and then you hit a diversion and they never tell you when it's going to happen, where you have to go, mm. and then you go around the diversion and half an hour later you're back where you started. Same for you, Richard, are you a regular? Well, I hope so. I was banking on being back for the, before the pubs closed. But <laughs> at this rate, who knows? Don't worry, we've got a few yeah. hours left on the Skycopter. We'll call right, that, okay. bring it in, you'll be absolutely fine. Uh, stay where you are. Coming up, we will be relying on Richard and Rhea uh, for their takes in Good Week, Bad Week. And what a week it was at Cheltenham for two former football managers, including Sir Alex Ferguson, who <laughs> picked up a rather different kind of double than usual. And plus, the political journalist Michael Crick will be joining us to hopefully explain why the Conservative Party is wrestling with whether to accept yet more money from a donor who used racist remarks about Diana. All that and more after this.
I think there's two reasons. One is major league cricket, which was a league that started last year, and that is T20. And the knock-on effect of that is America's one of the hosts of the T20 World Cup, and that's going to see America involved but also India-Pakistan, one of the fiercest rivalries in cricket, and that takes place in New York. And T20 is fast, it's furious, it's all action, and it's attracting big crowds in new stadiums or stadiums also that are still being built, including in Los Angeles. And the stadiums are being packed because the tickets are affordable, because there's a number of South Asian expats in particular in the United States of America that are packing those stadiums out. And then because it's fast and furious and all action, we're getting a lot of baseball fans attending as well because they see the crossover. But unlike in baseball, which drags on for three and a half hours and sometimes doesn't even have a home run, there's a six every other minute in this T20 format. And I think a lot of the baseball fans are enjoying that. In the United States of America, the streaming hasn't traditionally always been conducive in terms of when you want to get up and you're working hours. But a lot of those that live in America, and we should say Canada as well, are starting to realize from highlights and from social media in particular, when they see maybe a big six and they think, wow, that's interesting. And suddenly they watch it again and again, they look up the rules and then they realize maybe there's a stadium down the road. These new major league cricket teams are on both coasts and centrally as well. You've got Los Angeles, you've got New York, you've got San Francisco, you've got Seattle, you've got Texas and you've got Washington. So maybe what you see online prompts people to go with their families as well because the stadiums are very accessible and the tickets compared to baseball, for example, are very cheap. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Continuing our review of the week's news, it is at this point we always ask, who's had a good week and who has had a bad one? The weekend is here, so who is relieved it's all over and who has finished a winner? Two winners certainly still with us, Richard Brooks and Ria Lena. And Richard, we're going to start with you. Your choice um, for, 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 for having a good week. Katie Downey, now this is a name I remember. This is one of those who've been campaigning over the Horizon IT scandal. Yeah, Casey Downey is, is a, a young woman, a 25-year-old woman, who has launched uh, an excellent initiative to help uh, the children of sub-postmasters who were victimised and persecuted um, uh, over many years. Mm. Um, and she's addressing some of the indirect but equally serious consequences of this scandal. You know, we've all heard how people have been falsely convicted, yeah. made bankrupt and so on. Um, but many of their children have suffered equally. Uh, they've had their, their, their childhoods disrupted. Uh, in Katie Downey's case, they had to move abroad. Um, what, what, caused... Specifically why? Uh, just, just because of the, the negative feeling well, that there her, was in the her, area? Her, her, Father Tony was forced to sell his post office in the Lake right. District. They had a lovely life in the Lake District. He was forced to give that up because of a, a false um, shortfall in his branch accounts. Um, they then moved to France with, uh, with almost no notice, and his daughter um, says that she had a very difficult time there. She couldn't mm -hmm. speak the language and so on. This causes, as in many cases, it causes fractures in families. It yeah. causes harm to education. Um, and these are indirect costs that it's unlikely the compensation schemes are going to be able to address. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately. The lawyers the, don't yeah. like addressing indirect harm, mm. but it's no more serious because of that. No. Um, and what Kate is doing is bringing together a group of people, and this is what's worked so well with the postmasters themselves, what mm. Alan Bates did. When he brought them together, it didn't just launch the campaign for justice, it kind of gave them a sense that they weren't alone um, and, and really, um, you, you know, they all found it incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. So I think what she's done uh, for the young people caught up in this, or younger people, is, is really commendable and, uh, you know, 
Yeah, good not, luck to her with that. You're not going to hear me disagreeing with, with, with a word of that. Um, Ria, though, your, your choice uh, for Good Week is a, is a slightly more esoteric one. Uh, you think it has been a good week uh, for sequoias, otherwise known as redwoods. As the redwoods, Big yes, trees. It's, it's been a great week for them. Well, actually, it's been a great couple of hundred years for them. <laughs> it turns out. So we, the Victorians brought them over uh, from... from the Americas, and they've thrived over here. And they're, and they're going to look at, at the effects of this. They're going to study some of the trees. But essentially, some of them now here in the UK are, are 55, 60 metres tall, mm. which is incredible. And they're finding that the climate that Britain has now is perfect for them. Mm. And they're wondering whether this can be their new home as California continues to heat up and become a lot less conducive to... To the you know to, to growing them. And the, I mean, um, they are, love them. I mean, they're, love they're stun they are stunning to look at. There are a couple mm. of arboretums I've been to. There's one one in the Cotswolds and there's one down in the New Forest. The one in the Cotswolds I went to more recently, and it is stunning when you're standing next to these things. Mm. They are they are almost otherworldly. And many many years ago, I went to uh, uh, you know, I saw them in Yellowstone, um, and it was. It, it, a genuine revelation. I had no idea that something that comes out of the ground, that something that started yeah. as a seed, could could ever have that amount of scale. And they live for thousands yeah. of years, <clears> and <throat> we're finding that. I mean, they're not going to solve the the problem, but they soak up a lot of carbon dioxide in the yeah. areas that they are in, and and they're be they're just beautiful. They are. They are certainly uh, my selection uh, for Good Week at uh, this time. Uh, well, the team have gone for uh, two former football managers, Sir Alex Ferguson and Harry Redknapp. Uh, both of them having winners at the Cheltenham Festival. Alex Ferguson do, doing pretty well, I have to say, in retirement. You don't get the impression that he's looking back and wishing that he was back. Well, actually, maybe he might want to be back he's, at Man U. But... He's <laughs> still rearing winners. I yeah. mean, he's doing what he knows best. Have you been following some, Cheltenham? Some Man U fans might be wishing he was looking back. i tell you, that's, <laughs> that's certainly true. But have you, have you, did, did, did anyone have a, have a line on Cheltenham this week? I, I, I did a no. double, which got me from a £5 bet Ten pounds. So I'm not exactly king of the gamblers, I have to say. Those two, I suspect, will have had a rather better time. I'll be honest. When you say Cheltenham Festival, I I think arts festival. So <laughs> I just thought he'd done a wonderfully, you know, pathos hour. Uh, yes, another about member, his childhood. Another like, member of that. the liberal one percent uh, <laughs> on the show. Um, but let's do, let's move, move back to you this time, uh, Richard. Your choice for a bad week at uh, Ramblers. Why? Yeah, it's it's. Well, it's not a good country for ramblers, really. And there's a study come out uh, from a group called Right to Rome mm -hmm. that points out that um, in most of what are called national landscapes, there used to be areas of outstanding natural beauty, um, less than 10% of the land is accessible for, for walkers. Um, and this this so, presumably is in England, because I know that there, England, are different, yeah, there are different Scotland, rules in yeah, Scotland. Yeah, you're all right in Scotland. You've got a kind of embedded right to roam yeah. anywhere you like, um, subject to certain, you know, conditions. Um, but, it, but here, the Cotswolds, for example, is 1% of land you can walk on. You know, this is... Mm. You know, this is some of the most beautiful countryside. That's why uh, the, everyone you know, buys it. That's why there, David yeah. Cameron and all the rest of them go and, goes and lives in the Cotswolds. But you can't walk. If you if you go up there, you find you you know you go up a lane and then you get to a no exit, and you know it's it's frustrating. Um, so this group are objecting. On Sunday, they've got a mass trespass mm -hmm. on the an estate called the Bathurst Estate in the Cotswolds. Mm -hmm. um, because that, that estate charges something like four pounds to walk on its land. But it's the principle, really, that, yeah. you know, this green and pleasant land it's, should be for all. I mean, the guy at the Bathurst estate was, was funded on, you know, from slavery. That's yeah. how it was bought. Yeah. So, you know, to then say, Ooh. and I'm keeping it, and you're not coming on... Yeah, that's a little is awkward. a little bit it? rich. It is. Although it sounds like it's a bit of a win for nature if, if it's not being completely... Mm. I mean, I, I think, as we said outside, a true rambler is a wonderful thing, but, you know, mm. you do get a lot of people leaving little bags of... Oh, don't, of, don't, don't, don't get started. Don't get <laughs> you've, started. Got to, you've got to obey the country code. You do. Yes, I do. do. And, and they do, to be fair. I think ramblers do. Yeah. Ria, take us to your bad week selection. Oh. This is an interesting one, my neck of the woods. Um, the yes. People at the, the, the canteen at, Holly, uh, at Holyrood, at the Scottish Parliament, uh, they're up in arms. What over? Well, well, Christine Graham, MSP, has mm -hmm. complained about the quality of the food in the Holyrood canteen. Apparently it has dropped and she's not willing to pay the <laughs> £2.50 uh, for a bacon buddy and a, and a cup of coffee that it costs there. But that's still cheaper than Greg's. Yeah, of course it is. Because it's subsidised. It's, it's subsidised to about £70 million a year. But she sent out an email going, is anyone else unhappy with this? We should mm -hmm. do something about it. And most people said, you know what? 
given yeah. the cost of living crises that are happening right now, maybe we should bring a pack lunch? <laughs> if you're not happy, bring a pack lunch? Possibly. You could, they could be sitting there at First Minister's questions, having their cheese and pickle sandwiches. Actually, to com compare and contrast a related story to this one, down at the Palace of Westminster, they're, they're going to be up in arms very, very soon because the booze price, you know, the price of mm -hmm. a pint in Strangers is going up by 11% which will just about take it over five pounds. You can find me a pint in London for yeah, five yeah. quid. I, 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 well, send, me the, send me the address, first and foremost. Um, I want to finish, though, however, our selection for Bad Week this week. Foreign states trying to buy our newspapers because it does look mm -hmm. that that's, that is now coming to an end, which I suspect that you might be quite, quite, quite happy with, Richard. Yeah, I mean, the ownership of the media is 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 not a, a great thing in this country. You know, it's no. concentrated in very few hands as it is and some not particularly, not always pleasant hands. Um, so to go further and, and to have newspapers owned by a state and, and quite an oppressive state at that uh, would be, you know, a, a seriously retrograde move. So the fact that this is, appears to be falling through mm -hmm. and that the government is taking a measure to prevent this kind of takeover is, is to be welcomed. It's not to say that influence doesn't exist. No, I mean, we've not. got the Saudi ownership of a stake mm -hmm. in, uh, in British newspapers, and that is quite already quite influential, mm -hmm. but we couldn't go any further and have a complete takeover. So that's good. It's not good for George Osborne, the former <laughs> chancellor who Seminar. was no. promoting it as one of his many highly lucrative jobs, uh, which, you know, he seems to get despite not exactly excelling in, in any of them. Um, so... He's got, yeah. he's got a decent podcast. Well, well, he was yeah, hired yeah. specifically because they thought he'd have the influence with the current government to be able yeah. to make this happen, and instead it raised a red flag, and they went, no, you can't have our telegraph. But what I think is interesting is that even though maybe something great has come out of this where we've banned foreign ownership or, or look, looking to of our media, I wonder whether they would have had the same reaction if it had been the Guardian they were going after instead of the telegraph. Well, we, can, we, we will never know, thanks to the trust that funds the Guardian's journalism. I'm very lucky. It may play into Rupert Murdoch's hands, this. I think, I, I, th I think that is the, that is the point. It could concentrate a lot mm. of power, couldn't it? Uh, Richard, Ria, you guys stick right where you are. We will be coming back to you uh, after the break. Uh, also coming up after the break, I'm going to be joined by the political journalist Michael Crick following yet another absolutely bonkers week for the Conservatives.
Welcome back. Now, we have spent a lot of this week, a lot of this week, discussing if the Conservative Party should return that £10 million donation from Frank Hester uh, following his racist, sexist comments about the MP Diane Abbott. But far from planning to give back the money back tonight, the Conservative Party is still mulling over whether to accept another £5 million from the healthcare entrepreneur. In the last hour, Diane Abbott gave a speech in Hackney. Here's a little flavour of what she said. This is not about me. This is about the level of racism that is still in Britain. And this is about the way that black women are disrespected. Uh, joining us on the programme to discuss this, the broadcaster and writer Michael Crick. Michael, great to have your company this evening. Uh, uh, that's a week and a half that we've just gone through, isn't it? Uh, at the end of it, do you think we are edging any closer to the Conservatives handing, handing back any of that money? Well, I think probably in the end they will have to hand it back. But, I mean, the story you've got tonight, and, and well done, Sky, for, for, for getting it, uh, is uh, about them, you know... Not, not that they've already taken an extra five million, but they're still in discussions to take an extra five million. I would have thought anybody with an ounce, an ounce of political sense would realise that given the row of the last week, you do not consider another penny from this man. And it's just breathtaking. Uh, now, if they already have taken five million of, of his money, which was the story up until an hour or two ago, that, that is also dreadful. And the way in which they've, you know, refused to be open and transparent about this, you know, no wonder the British public think that all uh, all politicians are dishonest and, and crooked. Why can't they just be straight with us and say, yes, we are negotiating for another five million and then explain why? Or why can't they say, yes, we have had another five million? And it's, it's going to dog them for the next eight months until the election, which I think will be in October or, or November. It's just dreadful political tactics by uh, Rishi Sunak and his friends. But the problem is the Conservative Party desperately need a good war chest. They need more than Labour because Labour's got lots of volunteers, lots of party members, lots of young, enthusiastic activists. They've got the momentum, so people are excited to go out and campaign for Labour, whereas the, the Conservatives are expected to lose, so nobody's very excited to go out and campaign for them. And their membership is, is frankly, uh, quite old, you know, sort of average age in, in their 60s. And so what they need is they need to spend a lot of money employing agencies to do the jobs which would normally in an election be done by volunteers. In other words, going around putting leaflets through doors, sending them by post or doing phone banking. All of that would be done by volunteers, by so, normal political parties in the past. So, so Michael, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So, so Stephen Flynn, the SNP's leader at Westminster, perhaps had, then had a point at Prime Minister's questions this week when he accused uh, the Prime Minister, and indeed the Conservative Party, of prioritising money over morality. Well, uh, you know, in the circumstances I've described, one, you know, one, one sort of understands it. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a government that's gone through so much uh, untrustworthiness, frankly, dating back to the Boris Johnson days and Partygate and all of that. And what uh, Rishi Sunak should, be, should have been doing is winning back the trust of voters, and instead of which he's got embroiled in this situation with Mr Hester's money, and now more of Mr Hester's money, it seems, and it's just going from bad to worse. And you know, I thought, I, I, you know, I've thought for a long time the idea of a huge Labour landslide uh, is exaggerated and at the end of the day, Labour will win, but perhaps only by, by 50 or 60 seats. I'm now beginning to think that maybe Labour will win with a, a majority of 100, 200, you know, possibly even 300, which would be record-breaking. Um, because the, the, the Rishi Sunak is handling these issues in such an inept way. He's a very inexperienced politician in many ways. He's only been in politics for about 10 years, and he doesn't have the basic instincts for politics that uh, much more, you know, other politicians do have. And that's why he keeps making uh, errors like this. And, uh, you know, the polls are going down and down rather than him narrowing the gap, which is what normally happens in the months before an election that the, the government claws back.
Just, just a word from you, Michael, before we bring the panel, just, just a word from you, Michael, on, on Labour, because Labour have the, their own issues when it comes to racism. We can leave aside the party funding just for a second. W what do you think is going to happen as regards, as regards Diane Abbott? She clearly wants the whip back. She's, she's said as much. She's been very public about it. But, but we cannot forget the fact, you know, we had the, the Ford report, which Labour sat on, the hierarchy of racism uh, within the party. You know, she herself said in that, in that letter that she claims was sent from drafts, we can all make up our own minds about that, but she said stuff in that letter that, that almost demanded the whip was removed from her. Do you think she's coming back? Well, I think it's a bit illogical to say that she should have the whip restored simply because she's had a rough time from Mr. Yeah. She should have the whip re restored because that's the right thing to do. And I think it is the right thing to do. And I think, actually, Keir Starmer has been mean-spirited about both Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn. After all, he sat alongside them in the shadow cabinet for years and years and years, going on about how Jeremy Corbyn was, uh, you know, a, a friend of his and, and would make a great prime minister. And now he's turned on them. And I, I think, although that might win votes, I just think it, it's not the decent thing to do. Diane Abbott has, has as the first black woman in, in British politics, made her name and will we'll go down in history. And I think it's... Yeah, the whip should be restored and she should be allowed to bite her seat uh, at the election. Although I appreciate there will be a lot of people, Jewish people and others as well, who um, think that what she said to the Observer uh, that time ago, that those months ago, uh, is unforgivable. But I think on balance, she should be allowed back. Uh, Richard and, and Rhea, just listening into our chat here in the studio. Mm. I mean, Richard, you first. I mean, yeah, Diana, yeah. Do you, where are you on that? And indeed, on the, on the broader story about party funding, I mean, it's been something uh, the eye has covered in depth over many, many, many years. Uh, yeah, well, I think on, on the Diana, but I think, you know, Michael's right the, to have some sympathy with her. She's obviously done a huge amount. Um, but, uh, but I, and, and she needs to be shown a way back. But mm. I think that does involve her making some move as well in um, recognising what she did wrong and showing some contrition for that. And then, yeah, and, I, and then I think they, they could move on. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think, you know, in a spirit, you know, th that, that's the spirit that, that we need now in that case. But we're not we're, quite there. We're not quite there, that's right. And on the party funding, I mean, I'll be interested to hear what Michael thinks about um, what um, Frank Hester thinks is in it for him on the uh, donations, how, how transactional he sees, you know, as a seasoned observer of these things, uh, how transactional he thinks this arrangement is. We, um, we have a story in Private Eye, this issue, about just how much Hester is making from the NHS. He makes 40 to 50 million pounds a year from the NHS, pays himself 10 million pounds in dividends, um, and then he gives a chunk of that <laughs> to the Conservative Party and the contracts keep on rolling. Um, What's your take on that, Michael? Well, I, I haven't read this week's the latest Private Eye. Uh, well, is he talking? I don't know if he's talking about the next one or the last one, but I'm always a bit behind with my Private Eyes. And by the way, you you do absolutely brilliant work, uh, it, it, uh, Richard. In, uh, you are one of the great investigative journalists of our age, and I think <laughs> everybody <laughs> owes a huge debt to you. I mean, if that is the case, I mean, it's dreadful. And, and uh, sometimes people give money to a political party because they want to be close to the prime minister and they want to be close to people in power and they're not expecting anything. Or they may want, you know, they may genuinely believe in it uh, and so on. But there are others where the motives are a little bit more base. And from what you're yeah. saying, that's the case here with Mr Hester, but i better be careful uh, uh, how yes, far... Yes, please, please, please. I was please. just going to say, please, <laughs> let's, let's, let's all be very, very careful. We don't all have the same quality yeah. of lawyers that private eye has. I mean, really, just... <laughs> a, just, just, just I'm a lawyer. No, a, a, fi a, final, a final kind of word, a comment from your question from you. We've got about a minute left. Uh, I don't... Like, actually, if it, as a just a member of the public, what I don't understand is why we constantly hold Labour up to the standard of the Ford report and the hierarchy of racism, and yet, because there, is it simply because there's no report about how much racism goes on in the, in the Conservative Party that they're allowed to continue to do this? And they, they seem to shoot in all directions. Is it because we just expect it of them? Why, why, no. why do we have one standard for the Labour Party and a report, mm -hmm. and, and the Conservatives keep doing this? Michael, you get 10 seconds. Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, we're being, we're being uh, very uh, hot on the... Uh, a bit critical of the, the Conservatives right now. The other thing I would say is journalists should be asking a lot more questions of Labour mm. 
about Angela Rayner and her council house sale and capital gains tax My and all of that. Michael, I'm so sorry. We are <laughs> going to have to leave it there. Michael Crick, thank you so much for your time. And, guys, it has been a pleasure having you both back in. Richard, Ria, we will see you soon. We're going to take a short break. Afterwards, we've got the sport, and Teddy will be here going through a difficult draw in quarterfinals of the Champions League. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News' West of England correspondent. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. Welcome back. Ignore the rugby for a bit. There is a big weekend in football. Crucial games in the Premier League relegation race as well as the FA Cup quarterfinals. And speaking of quarterfinals, there are some mouth-watering ties for the English clubs still in Europe following today's draws. Teddy is back with... Well, you could, to explain exactly there's what is to, happening... <laughs> how long we've got, but there's a lot to get through there, isn't there, potentially? Should we start with the FA Cup? Yeah. To, to be fair, it's, we, are, we are getting to the latter stages and this is all getting rather interesting and exciting. Yeah, the European ties will happen next, uh, next month, but the FA Cup is right upon us. Quarterfinals uh, tomorrow, Chelsea against Leicester City now in the Championship, but Leicester winning the FA Cup mm. in 2021. Looked like they should get back at a wobble but get back to the Premier League then it's uh, Manchester United against Liverpool that's sorry on Sunday Saturday I should say kicks off with Wolves against Coventry now Wolves one of those teams that in the all-time list is pretty high they've won yeah. four FA Cups but not since 1960 and then I was going to say I was trying to remember yeah. it happened in my lifetime no. <laughs> not quite no no and you've got Coventry in 1987 so that's an, a nice one but then Manchester City going for the treble they've got Real Madrid <coughs> in the Champions League quarterfinals up against Newcastle United who haven't won the FA Cup since 1955. And they've slipped to mid-table, had a difficult season under Eddie Howe after getting to the Champions League. It all proved maybe a little bit too much. That's a huge match Saturday evening. But I suppose a lot of focus will be on that Manchester United-Liverpool one, two most successful sides totally. in English football historically. United have more FA Cups than Liverpool, but people will be backing, I think, Jurgen Klopp to continue his quadruple farewell I, uh, at Old Trafford on Sunday. I don't want to upset any Man United fans, but I mean, that, this one's Liverpool's, isn't it? Yeah, well, United have only got one win in six against Liverpool. They did win the last match at Old Trafford last season. They did win the last time they met in the FA Cup. But you look at Liverpool, they scored six against Sparta Prague on Thursday after scoring five against them away. It's 11 in two games. They're through to the Europa League quarter-final. They've got bankrupt through goal bonuses. They're, they're, they're absolutely flying, aren't they, in terms of uh, Jurgen Klopp's farewell. He's got a few months left. He confirmed that he's not going to change his mind now that Michael Edwards mm. is coming as chief executive. But for United, sixth in the table, lost more games than any season, though, since 89-90. They would 
dearly love to, to try and get back to the FA Cup final. They lost mm. to Manchester City last season, but it, I think the odds would definitely be on, on Liverpool getting that, and particularly the way Liverpool are playing. That, yeah. that game against Manchester City last weekend finished 1-1, but have we seen any team in the world overrun City the way they did in the, in the second half at times? OK, Man United not having the, the form that they once had, but, mm. they're, but they're certainly not in the relegation zone. Those who are, however, this yes. will be a very pivotal weekend. It certainly is. A, it's a big weekend, particularly all eyes on Luton against Nottingham Forest. Now, Luton had this crushing result on Wednesday. It was very nice that captain Tom Lockyer went back to Bournemouth for the rearranged game mm. and Luton then went into a 3-0 lead. But Bournemouth, for only the third time in Premier League history, a side came from 3-0 down at half-time to beat Luton 4-3. And they're, they're three points from safety. You think that was a real big blow for them. They've lost the last three at home as well. But Nottingham Forest, I think, have only won 12 of the last 17. You, mean, you remember they changed their manager. Steve Cooper left. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a big catalyst. Nuno Espirito Santo, Portuguese former Wolves manager, came in. Hasn't quite turned it around for Forest. They're just above the relegation zone. Also, three o'clock Saturday. Really interesting one. Burnley, second bottom in the table. Looks like they might well be returning to the championship. But up against yeah. Brentford, a local side to us here at uh, Sky. And if Brentford were to lose that, then perhaps they're going to be pulled back into that relegation pitch. It's a really interesting there, six pointers. Then the top four as well. Tottenham can go fourth on, on Saturday evening at 5.30 away at, at Fulham in that London derby. So there's a lot, lot happening in the world of football. You are in hogs heaven this weekend. <laughs> Before that, though, you've got some other sport to give us. So Absolutely. Busy weekend. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with vitality. Every week across the UK, 85% of school-age students take part in approximately an hour of sport a week. Organised grassroots sport has lower numbers, but it translates to millions of girls and boys between the age of 7 and 20 playing sport. But there is a problem, a big problem. Without doubt, every year, we seem to be seeing more and more young people coming through with significant knee injuries and primarily we're talking about ACL ruptures. The numbers are staggering and extremely worrying. For every one person that was having an ACL reconstruction in uh, the late 90s, there's now 29 children having those surgeries. So the number of injuries is without a doubt. 29 fold? Yeah. Evidence of a problem comes from multiple sources. Other surgeons and doctors are waving a warning flag. We increase by 29 folds amount of operation. Devastating injuries that, are, that, that can cause complete change of the life trajectory and early risk of arthritis. People are committing to uh, one or two sports at most at the moment, uh, if they are going to be part of the local community. And they, they spend less time developing other skills that will be naturally developed uh, when they are participating in multiple sports. They're on screens, sedentary, and then suddenly they're in very organised, highly competitive sports environments. There's some evidence about, you know, sports specialisation. So if you have a, a child who's very good at one sport, they might be pushed down that kind of route and only play that sport. Probably the second biggest reason is that there's a huge knowledge gap in the UK about the importance of injury prevention programmes and the importance of warming up kids. Mm -hmm. There's this myth in grassroots sport that kids don't get injured so they don't need to warm up. Just, you know, get off on the pitch and off you go. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Teddy, thank you. Time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. And the weather remains mild but unsettled this weekend with further showers or longer spells of rain. Thicker clouds over parts of eastern Britain will bring some drizzly rain, drizzly rain this evening, but earlier daytime showers will fizzle out uh, to leave most places dry. A brief ridge of high pressure overnight means the winds will ease, any lingering, uh, any lingering showers fade and temperatures drop as the skies clear. Uh, some fog patches are likely as well as a widespread rural frost. However, the cloud will build in the southwest, bringing rain and drizzle to parts of Ireland and southwest Britain. 
Much of Britain will have a chilly but dry start to Saturday, just a few mist and fog patches around. The cloud will thicken from the southwest as outbreaks of rain spread slowly northeastwards through the day, although many northern and eastern parts will remain dry and bright until after dark. A pulse of heavier rain will push across Ireland into western fringes of Britain during the afternoon, accompanied by brisk winds. Saturday's rain will clear to sunshine and showers on Sunday. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the last hour of Friday night, we will have the very latest on the situation in Gaza as Israel approves a military operation in the city of Rafa. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in the final hour of the show, we're going to be live in Washington, where the Irish T-shirt is hoping a pint or two of the black stuff can mend his relationship with the US president. But first, the headlines this hour. Israel rejects Hamas' latest ceasefire proposal on the day that Benjamin Netanyahu approved plans for a military operation in Rafah. But a ship carrying 20 tonnes of aid and medical supplies has finally arrived off the coast of Gaza. Protests at Russia's rubber stamp election. The polls open with Putin on course to secure power for another six years. Diane Abbott speaks out publicly for the first time since she was the subject of racist and sexist remarks from the Tory donor Frank Hester. Grinding to a halt, this is seen at what should be Britain's busiest motorway. Uh, but tonight, the M25 is shut between junctions 10 and 11, causing some misery for motorists. Also tonight, the Irish Prime Minister is meeting Joe Biden at their annual St Patrick's Day summit. But relations, while well, they remain strained over support for Israel's actions in Gaza, will be live in Washington with our senior island correspondent, David Levins. And the film critic Anna Smith will be back, helping us decide what to watch this weekend. What's the first rule of Friday night? 
to talk about Fight Club, the film that helped make Brad Pitt a superstar. Well, it's back in cinemas celebrating its 25th anniversary. Oh, goodness. Uh, great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has downplayed chances of a truce in Gaza, calling proposals by Hamas unrealistic. Meanwhile, he is understood to have approved plans for a military operation in Rafah. All this is an aid ship loaded with nearly 200 tonnes of food and supplies has now arrived off the coast of Gaza. Our Middle East correspondent Ali Bunko has our first report. Rafah, on the Egyptian border, has become a massive refugee camp for more than a million Gazans who have fled fighting in the north. Moving them to somewhere else in Gaza ahead of a land invasion will probably take some time, but the Israeli government says it has now approved plans for that to happen. We have to see a clear and implementable plan, not only to get uh, civilians out of harm's way, but also to make sure that once out of harm's way, they're appropriately cared for with shelter, with food, with medicine, with clothing, and we've not yet seen such a plan. With Israeli forces closing in, Hamas has delivered a new ceasefire proposal to Israel and said they will now accept an initial temporary ceasefire. They had previously insisted on a permanent one and the withdrawal of all Israeli forces. The Israeli war cabinet met this afternoon and described some of Hamas's demands as unrealistic, but announced a delegation will travel to Qatar for further talks. Hamas's change in position is significant because it removes what had been one of the major obstacles to a new hostage deal. Although the Israeli government has been in public quite dismissive of it, clearly the gap between the two sides is narrowing. After three days sailing, the aid ship finally appeared off the coast of Gaza. Palestinians watched expectantly from the beaches as it came into the offing. Satellite images taken over the past few days show a temporary pier being constructed ahead of the ship's arrival. The first aid from the new maritime corridor was eventually taken ashore. It is expected that more ships will follow in the coming days and weeks. More airdrops were carried out over Gaza today. In the north, where the hunger is most severe, this is still one of the only ways that daily aid gets in. As large crowds gathered around a landing spot, a teenage boy on the right of the screen climbs over the heads of the people in a desperate rush not to miss out. There are thousands of people. They dropped 20 bundles for 200,000 people. I came here to pick up a tin of beans, a packet of pasta, a kilogram of rice for my children, but I left empty-handed. In Gaza, hopes for another ceasefire have given way to a daily struggle just to eat with negotiation talks progressing on the one hand and Israel getting ready for a new phase of fighting on the other. It's unclear what direction this war will take next and what their fate will be. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Voters in Russia are heading to the polls in a three-day presidential election that is certainly expected to extend Vladimir Putin's rule by six more years. Now, he is standing virtually unchallenged following the death of his biggest rival, Alexei Navalny, in an Arctic prison. But there have been signs of dissent with some protests and polling stations and even some ballots set on fire. Sky's Diana Magni reports. Long queues outside polling stations on day one of three, an electoral foregone conclusion because when polls close, the president will remain Vladimir Putin, no matter the other names on the ballot papers. Such events are unfolding now. Of course, I want to make my own choice and support our commander-in-chief. I decided to vote for the communists, for Haritonov, because I want some small changes and some more justice in our society. 
Putin's. Yes, I am for Putin. Because we need stability, definitely. We already know what to expect from this man, from the president. And this time it is not just in Russia or in embassies abroad where people are voting, but on Ukrainian soil too. In the territories which Russia now occupies two years into this war. Here, a polling station in Mariupol, a pro-Russian view because those who don't feel this way would not dare to speak out. Since we are a new region that joined Russia, it was important in our life to vote and choose our president of our Russia. Vladimir Putin voted online, electronic voting a new feature in presidential polls. His political nemesis, Alexei Navalny, the one man who might have challenged him, is dead. His final call from jail was for people to come to the polling stations at noon this Sunday to show that they don't agree. Denis Sakharov wants to go. He feels the role of those who oppose this regime now is to keep the focus on all those that remain behind bars. The whole concept of Russian politics can be described as necropolitics because it's all about death and about survival. We wait for Putin to die. We look at political prisoners being killed. But I think we need to think about the living and people who are alive and fixate on them, on those who we can still save, like Yashin Karamurza and all the political prisoners, because they are still alive and they are in grave danger. Protest is manifesting itself already in different ways. Arson at one polling station, a Molotov cocktail outside another, Green dye poured into ballot boxes to spoil the votes. A febrile atmosphere in a country at war. And in Belgorod, right on Russia's border with Ukraine, more shelling from the Ukrainian side and more armed incursions from that way too. The Nazi Kyiv regime is trying to carry out a number of demonstratively criminal armed attacks with the aim of disrupting the voting process and intimidating people in the regions bordering Ukraine. This primarily involves striking civilian settlements on Russian territory. But who can blame Ukraine for wanting to strike back when this is the destruction that Russia continues to wreak on their homes, scores killed in Odessa this Friday? The man responsible far away in the Kremlin, determined not to stop. Diana Magne, Sky News. Now, a section of the M25 has been closed in both directions across all lanes for the first time in the motorway's history, leading to anxious calls of Carmageddon and fears of gridlock throughout Surrey. An estimated 6,000 vehicles an hour will be funnelled off at junctions 10 and 11 and onto the single carriageway local A roads. The aim is to reduce congestion and collisions at this hotspot, uh, which is apparently the worst on the UK's busiest motorway. But the closure is set to disrupt travellers, uh, including those heading to Heathrow and Gatwick airports, even though just this small section of the motorway will be closed off. As guys, Sadia Chowdhury is there. She joins us now uh, from a gantry above the M25. Good to see you, Sadia. So, so how has it gone so far? I suspect we might have to wait until the weekend proper uh, to find out just how much traffic chaos this closure might cause. Yeah, it looks like people have been anticipating this closure and so the traffic has been thinning out over the last hour and we can see that the anti-clockwise carriageway is now completely quiet and there are still a few cars going uh, on the clockwise, in the clockwise direction and they must feel very lucky because this was supposed to have been closed by 9 o'clock which means they avoid that diversion. It is quite an occasion because if you pan over that way you'll see some of the locals have come out to have a look as well because... This is an unprecedented event. The M25 has never closed in both directions at the same time and certainly not for this long. And that is, of course, all because of a bridge that needs to come down so that they can make improvements to the motorway. And that bridge can't simply be blown up. It has to be taken up apart bit by bit. And that will take a total of 14 hours on just the breaking down part of it, plus all the prep stuff. So they've got two days to do that. It is having an impact, impact on the locals because they're 
diversion means there'll be sort of lo lots of traffic jams in the local area, lots of people treating this like a pandemic and preparing to lock down for the weekend. It will also impact airport users, so Heathrow Airport and Gatwick Airport, both very short distances away from here. So anyone travelling to and from those airports or in between those airports will probably face delays. And of course it impacts the drivers because people have been um, told that they can expect up to five hours additional time on their journeys. So lots and lots of disruption this weekend for anyone that was thinking of using this part of the M25. It is a big road for the UK. It connects lots of different motorways together. It is the orbital around London. So it's a hugely popular road even to get across London. They've got two days to get this work done and they once they start the dem demolishing of the bridge, they can't stop. So it really is a really high pressure job for them. Yes, yeah, certainly is. Uh, fingers crossed you and the team managed to get home as well. Sadia for now, thanks very much. Diane Abbott has been at the centre of a political rout since it emerged. She was the subject of racist and sexist remarks from the Tory donor Frank Hester. Tonight, she's made an appearance at an event in East London, speaking publicly for the first time. Meanwhile, Sky News understands the Conservatives are in talks with Mr Hester about an additional £5 million donation, despite the party being under pressure to return his original £10 million donation. The Chancellor says the party will declare any donations when the time is right, as our political correspondent Matt Thompson reports. This week, Diane Abbott was denied the chance to speak out in Parliament as she was the subject of reportedly racist comments from a major Tory donor. Tonight, as hundreds of supporters gathered in her constituency of Hackney, she made her voice heard. This is not about me. This is about the level of racism that is still in Britain. And this is about the way that black women are disrespected. We've got the whole shot there. As the Prime Minister and Chancellor tried their hand behind the camera in Sunderland today, the focus remained firmly on the racism row. Rumours swirled about a further £5 million donation from controversial donor Frank Hester, on top of the £10 million already declared. The Chancellor, though, was tight-lipped. We absolutely are transparent. Uh, we follow all the rules, the regulations. We believe in that transparency. When the time is right, we will declare any, any donations that we've received recently. Hester caused outrage when The Guardian reported he'd said, amongst other distasteful things, that Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women. That led to calls for the Conservatives to hand back his millions. But far from returning the money, Sky News understands that the Conservative Party is still in talks to receive another £5 million from Mr Hester. Contrary to earlier reports, that money has not yet been handed over. If that's the case, it offers one possible explanation for the party's reluctance to brand his comments racist. Uh, comments about Diana Abbott this week. Labour were quick to jump at the latest revelations. Frank Hester's comments about Diane Abbott were racist, they were misogynistic. Comments like that have absolutely no place in our society. And to learn that on top of the £10 million that he's already given to the Conservatives, it looks like there's a further £5 million, frankly, I think is appalling. They should give that money uh, back. <laughs> Labour also sent a brood of chickens to Westminster this afternoon to tease the Prime Minister for not calling an election. But who knows, with more donations in the pipeline, a delay might just allow the Conservatives to get more bang for their buck. Matthew Thompson, Sky News. And if you scan the QR code on screen right now, you can listen to the latest episode of Electoral Dysfunction. Uh, the podcast where each week, Beth Rigby, Jess Phillips and Ruth Davidson unravel the spin in politics. Uh, this week, unsurprisingly, they've been discussing uh, the row over Frank Hester's comments and, of course, Lee Anderson's defection to the Reform Party. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Prince William and Prince Harry, well, they avoided seeing each other at a memorial event for their late mother last night fueling more speculation of a rift between them. The Duke of Cambridge attended the event at the Science Museum in London in person. His brother appeared via video link from California after he'd left. It comes as the Duchess of Sussex returns to Instagram to launch her new business venture. Here's our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock. 
Every year we come across the most incredible leaders in tech. They say timing is everything. And on one day, three appearances from the Sussexes. You won! <laughs> Announcing online their Archwell Foundation Civil Rights Award, complete with a $100,000 prize. And for Harry, another award ceremony, this one remembering Princess Diana. Thank you very much for inspiring so many others and, and at the same time protecting uh, my mother's legacy. I really appreciate that. And Tessie, again, well done on this fantastic group of individuals. Harry waited until William had left before joining the winners by video. <laughs> Even virtually, the two brothers keeping their distance. I wish you bluebirds. And from Meghan, a lifestyle launch. You can just make her out whisking in the kitchen. And then a kiss. With the website and Instagram account American Riviera Orchard. No details yet, but the US trademark registration lists jams, jellies, tableware and cookbooks. It is her recipe for the future. She's been here before, though, with her blog, The Tig. It stopped when she started seeing Harry. Similar concerns, now she's cashing in on royal connections. With the new website, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see Meghan becoming potentially the new Martha Stewart. One brand expert who's worked with Meghan says it could make millions. Look at the, the king. He has Dutchy originals. You know, people all have these different brands, and that's jams and it's biscuits. You know, I think Meghan's allowed to have... Uh, a bit of her lifestyle that people can buy into. I think she'll always be open to criticism and people will criticise this, but I think the fact is it's pretty authentic. The lifestyle landscape's full of famous faces. Gwyneth Paltrow defied her critics but told Sky News it wasn't easy. It's actually funny at this point, you know, when I look back and I think about how mean people were about, like, you know, a number of things. I think there is maybe a satisfaction um, to know that, you know, not not to be glib, but just to know that I was on to something, my instincts were right. Meghan and Harry hoping their instincts are right as they rebrand into a lucrative but risky industry. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Uh, coming up next on Friday night, we've got an early start to St Patrick's Day with the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, meeting Joe Biden at the White House. But were they able to set aside their differences over Gaza? We'll discuss that and more next. I think there's two reasons. One is Major League Cricket, which was a league that started last year, and that is T20. And the knock-on effect of that is America's one of the hosts of the T20 World Cup, and that's going to see America involved, but also India-Pakistan, one of the fiercest rivalries in cricket, and that takes place in New York. And T20 is fast, it's furious, it's all action, and it's attracting big crowds in new stadiums or stadiums also that are still being built, including in Los Angeles. And the stadiums are being packed because the tickets are affordable, because there's a number of South Asian expats in particular in the United States of America that are packing those stadiums out. And then because it's fast and furious and all action, we're getting a lot of baseball fans attending as well because they see the crossover but unlike in baseball, which drags on for three and a half hours and sometimes doesn't even have a home run, there's a six every other minute in this T20 format. And I think a lot of the baseball fans are enjoying that. In the United States of America, the streaming hasn't traditionally always been conducive in terms of when you want to get up and you're working hours. But a lot of those that live in America, and we should say Canada as well, are starting to realise from highlights and from social media in particular when they see maybe a big six and they think, wow, that's interesting, and suddenly they watch it again and again, they look up the rules and then they realise maybe there's a stadium down the road. These new Major League cricket teams are on both coasts and centrally as well. You've got Los Angeles, you've got New York, you've got San Francisco, you've got Seattle, you've got Texas, and you've got Washington. So maybe what you see online prompts people to go with their families as well because the stadiums are very accessible and the tickets compared to baseball, for example, are very cheap.
welcome back. Uh, President Joe Biden has always been very proud of his Irish roots and with it being St Patrick's weekend, he should have been looking forward to meeting Leo Varadkar in Washington today. But tensions between the two leaders, well, they have been somewhat strained recently over Israel's invasion of Gaza. So how did the meeting go? Our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, uh, joins us now from Washington. David, great to see you. Let, let, let's start with that meeting with Joe Biden. And of course, he often makes very a, a huge amount, I would say, uh, of, of his Irish heritage. Uh, how is the state of the relations between the United States and the Republic right now? Hi, Neil. Yes, he certainly likes to talk up his Irish ancestry and the annual bilateral meeting to mark St Patrick's Week in the Oval Office was no different today. The Irish, uh, very Irish President of the United States quoting some poetry and old Irish proverbs, as he often does, to welcome his host, uh, Leo Varadkar, in the most cordial way. But uh, underneath it all, there is this underlying tension in relation to America's approach to the Middle East. And Leo Varadkar's under some pressure back home in Ireland uh, to deal with that. And of course, it's an election year in Ireland too. He's got to be seen to act. So very quickly at the beginning of their bilateral meeting, he pressed the case for an immediate uh, humanitarian ceasefire and for a two-state solution, which he described as the only possible route to peace. Notably, President Biden said, I agree. But within an hour, uh, the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, emerged from that meeting to tell us that the President had made it very clear that the US would continue to support Israel in its determination to uh, protect itself, uh, to defend itself. So it, we heard one thing on camera, but it seems a different thing happened behind closed doors. Mm, indeed. But look, look, look David, it, it is you know, St Patrick's weekend. Obviously, it's a big old event in the United States, almost as big, I suggest, as it is in the, in the Republic of Ireland. I'm just, I'm just wondering, what, what is the state of the relationship between the two countries? To, to, to outsiders, it does sometimes look quite curious, because, of course, the UK always talks about the special relationship it enjoys with the United States. Some would argue that the, that the Irish have a more arguable case for taking that, that title. Oh, absolutely. The Irish quite often talk about the truly special relationship they have with the United States. And let me tell you why it really matters to both sides, Neil. The United States invests $28 billion a year in Ireland. It's created, even in Northern Ireland alone, somewhere in the region of 30,000 jobs. Now, that's not a friend you want to fall out with. But equally, the relationship is two-way because there is a staggering one-third of the population of the United States claiming Irish ancestry. Um, when you think about it, that means there are 10 times more people in America claiming to be Irish than there are on the island of Ireland itself. So the Irish are influential on capital Hill and their vote matters. They played a huge part in the history of this nation. It was an Irish man who designed and built the White House, for example. The Irish uh -huh. built the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. So President Biden talks up this link a lot. He knows it really matters in terms of votes back home. And that's why every president since Reagan has visited Ireland. They didn't do it for no reason. Well, I, I completely understand. What then, uh, David, do the Irish make of Irish-Americans? Well, they've always been uh, very keen to encourage, encourage investment uh, yeah. from the Americans. But I think it's fair to say that the relationship is a little strained right now because back home, the depth of feeling over what's happening in the Middle East is strong. The Irish tend to associate much more with Palestine than they do with Israel. They're very uncomfortable about the position, this very Irish president. In fact, the most Irish president since John F. Since John F. Kennedy has adopted on this issue. And um, the, the Sinn Féin president, Mary Lou MacDonald, the woman who hopes to be the next Irish prime minister, to succeed Leo Varadkar is also in Washington and her message is very clear that she can't not be here because with 30,000 people 
dead. It is a responsibility of every Irish leader to press the case with the White House for some action on this that will bring about an immediate ceasefire. And they're calling on the United States to invest the same effort in terms of the Middle East that it once invested in Northern Ireland. And I think it's worth saying that the one thing they've been able to celebrate together this week is the restoration of uh, power sharing in Northern Ireland. The new First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, and Deputy First Minister, Emma Little Pengelly, really have been the toast of Capitol Hill throughout this week's celebrations, and I'm quite sure that will continue through this St. Patrick's weekend. Well, you mentioned the St. Patrick's weekend. Uh, David, can't have you on the programme without asking you what you will be up to, uh, aside, obviously, from watching Ireland lose to Scotland in the Six Nations. Well, aside from watching Ireland win the Six Nations tomorrow, I will uh, be watching very closely what goes on in the White House on Sunday afternoon because that's when the celebrations here culminate with the traditional shamrock ceremony when the Irish Prime Minister, Antisha Cleo Varadkar, will present a bowl of shamrock uh, to President Joe Biden. All of the leaders from Northern Ireland and the Republic will be at that event. We're going to hear some more words from the President and from the Irish uh, Taoiseach at the White House. White House on Sunday. It'll be very interesting to see if there's been movement from the White House after the pressure that's been brought by the Irish leader today, particularly in relation to the Middle East. Well, I, ho I hope you get at least a brief chance to celebrate, David. You know, all work and no play makes Mr Blevins a, a, a very boring boy. Um, but we'll let you crack on. A very busy weekend ahead. Enjoy St Patrick's Day when it comes. We'll speak again soon. Cheers, David. Thank you. Uh, let's take a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the weather remains mild but unsettled this weekend, uh, with further showers or longer spells of rain. Thicker clouds over parts of eastern Britain will bring some drizzly rain this evening, but earlier daytime showers will fizzle out, leaving most places dry. A brief ridge of high pressure overnight means the winds will ease, any lingering showers fade and temperatures will drop as the skies clear. Some fog patches are likely as well as a widespread rural frost. However, the cloud will build in the southwest, bringing rain and drizzle to parts of Ireland and southwest Britain. Much of Britain having a chilly but dry start to Saturday. To the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up after the break this Friday night, we'll be getting our Friday film fix with Anna Smith, including a 25th anniversary screening of a Brad Pitt classic.
Welcome back. The weekend is here. With that in mind, we're going to have a look at some of the latest uh, releases this week. Uh, joining us once again on the programme, the film critic and, of course, host of the Girls on Film podcast, Anna Smith. Anna, lovely to see you. Happy Thank Friday you. and all the rest of it. Um, we're going to start with, with a Japanese film that I'm, I'm, I'm told is described as complex, a family drama. I mean, I have to admit, I was reading something about this a little bit earlier. I, I can't wait to watch it. It's called Monster. It's called Monster. I think this should have been nominated for Oscars. It's mm. a tremendous film. It's set in Japan, as you mentioned, and it's one story told from three perspectives. So there's a young boy having trouble at school. Mm. First of all, we see everything from his mother's perspective. Then it shifts to the perspective of a teacher who's been accused of some wrongdoing. And then the boy's perspective. Shall we have a look at a clip where the mother chats to the son? Let's have a look. I mean, you're not, you're not the only person to suggest that there should have been an Oscar nomination for this. Why, though? Is it, is it the kind of the esoteric way in which this, the story is told? I mean, telling the same story from three different perspectives is the thing that I have to admit I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated and taken by. Well, of course it's been done before, but it's done so, so well yeah. with this, and it really makes you understand the different perspectives. I think, you know, film is all about empathy, and this mm. really makes you look at the different points of view. And it's like a mystery thriller in a way, and I love having to work a little bit in the film, and you have to really try and decode what's going on. And it really makes you think about, you know, how we all misread things, misunderstand things, and also the cinematography, as you can see, is gorgeous. Yeah, the performances are tremendous, the child actors are amazing, and it's very moving as well. Mm. How about your, 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 your second choice today? This is, this is a film called uh, Drive Away Dolls by one of the Coens. One I'm of told. the Coens, Ethan Cohen, and he's made this um, with his wife, the writer Trisha Cook, um, and it's a very different in some ways. It's sort of half a Cohen brothers film because mm. it's a kind of comedy crime caper. The other half is a sort of lesbian um, comedy road trip movie. The two halves don't entirely gel, um, but I was quite charmed by it, and I laughed. I laughed out loud quite a few times. And mm -hmm. um, the idea is that a couple of young girls um, decide it's 1999, and they decide to take a road trip using a car that they kind of rent on the basis of delivering it somewhere. And, of course, it belongs to some gangsters. It all goes horribly wrong. Let's have a look at uh, Margaret Qualley here in the scene. Where do you want to go? Tallahassee. Tallahassee. What's wrong with Tallahassee? It's very nice. There's Spanish moss and I think live oak. Curly here. Don't call me Curly. And your name Curly? My name is Curly. We just met. It's too familiar. Have you ever been to Tallahassee? No, I got good sense. Your car is a Dodge Aries. Oh, OK. Is that a good car? Not really. Right, OK, C correct me if I'm wrong here, Anna, cos I'm getting a, a very curious sense of deja vu. Two women on a road trip, there's a bit of crime involved and they meet a lot of interesting characters on the way. I mean, it's, it's not quite Thelma and Louise, but, but you know, it's, that was the first film I thought of when I heard about this. It's not Thelma and Louise, mm. no. I mean, it's, it's not that kind of ballpark. It's much mm. more raunchy, I would say. I've definitely read reviews of, of people in the States who've gone to see this and been a bit shocked at what they've seen, so be prepared for that. OK. Yeah, it's quite a... It's, it's, it's kind of a... It's kind of inspired by the exploitation movies of the 60s, like Russ Mayer movies. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, and it does have a great supporting cast. You've got Pedro Pascal, Matt Damon, amazing, Miley Cyrus amazing. has a great role in it, oh. a very pop-up role. So it's, it's quirky, definitely, not for everyone, but I was laughing out loud at certain points. Now, we can't, we can't have you here and not discuss... Fight Club. And the reason we're discussing Fight Club is not because it's being... It, not because it's just come out, of course. It came out... I can't quite believe I'm going to say this. It came out a quarter of a century ago, right? I can remember it, and it was such a visceral experience the first time you watched it. How does it stand up now? Really well. I yeah. watched it again the other day, and obviously I've seen it since it came mm. out, because it is one of these things that bears repeat watching once you know how everything plays out. Mm. And I think it's tremendous. I always get something new from it. Mm. I mean, Edward Norton is tremendous in this film, and, of course, Brad Pitt. I mean, the more you watch him in this, the more you get from his performance. Mm. And it's the kind of film that's great because it's coming back in cinemas. You can watch it on oh, streaming. Oh, wow, fantastic. You can watch it in cinemas this weekend. And I think it'd be a great thing to go with, maybe with some young people that haven't seen it, 
it before, but just watch out for all those little signs on the mm. big screen. There's lots of sort of tricks of the light and, you mm -hmm. know, and picture, and it's, but it's very funny as well. Mm. And Helena Bonham Carter is tremendous. Well, she, she, was, she was my favourite of it. In fact, we just we have it? for those of us who haven't seen it in an awful long time, maybe almost 25 years, why don't we have a quick clip? Yeah. Welcome to Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Third rule of Fight Club, someone yells stop, goes limp, taps out, the fight is over. Fourth rule, only two guys to a fight. Fifth rule, one fight at a time, fellas. My producer's just reminding me, of course, Meatloaf was in that, and it was in this as well, and it was, it was his favourite character. I, I suppose the thing about Fight Club, and it, it is, it's the director, it was David Fincher, who's what early days in his career, certainly hadn't had all the success then that, that he has had now, but again, I, I go back to this word visceral. This was a, a cinematic experience that you couldn't just sit back and passively watch. It involved you in it and you felt it, every gut punch of it. It's very true. It's a very immersive film. Mm. You're glued to the screen and, it, yeah, it does involve you. I mean, one minute you're laughing, the next minute you're repelled. Um, and it's very gripping. It's really laugh-out-loud funny. Tremendous. It really stands up, I think. Do you know what? I might. I, I'm not, I was going to take my, my eight year old to the cinema. I might not take him to see this, mm. I have to admit, but maybe in a few years' time. You never know. Anna, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks very much for being with us. Time for us, though, to get the latest sports. Teddy is standing by. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Every week across the UK, 85% of school-age students take part in approximately an hour of sport a week. Organised grassroots sport has lower numbers, but it translates to millions of girls and boys between the age of 7 and 20 playing sport. But there is a problem, a big problem. Without doubt, every year we seem to be seeing more and more young people coming through with significant knee injuries and primarily we're talking about ACL ruptures. The numbers are staggering and extremely worrying. For every one person that was having an ACL reconstruction in uh, the late 90s, there's now 29 children having those surgeries. So the number of injuries is without a doubt. 29 fold? Yeah. Evidence of a problem comes from multiple sources. Other surgeons and doctors are waving a warning flag. We increase by 29 folds amount of operation. Devastating injuries that, are, that, that can cause complete change of the life trajectory and early risk of arthritis. People are committing to uh, one or two sports at most at the moment, uh, if they are going to be part of the local community. And they, they spend less time developing other skills that would be naturally developed uh, when they are participating in multiple sports. They're on screens, sedentary, and then suddenly they're in very organised, highly competitive sports environments. There's some evidence about, you know, sports specialisation. So if you have a, a child who's very good at one sport, they might be pushed down that kind of route and only play that sport. Probably the second biggest reason is that there is a huge knowledge gap in the UK about the importance of injury prevention programmes and the importance of warming up kids. Mm -hmm. There's this myth in grassroots sport that kids don't get injured so they don't need to warm up, just you know, get off on the pitch and off you go. It couldn't be farther from the truth. You look at Australia, you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, Netherlands, Canada, all of them have started trying to put together national programmes to deliver these warm-up programmes, and in the UK that really hasn't happened. It's embarrassing to say that we're from the UK. We are so behind the rest of the world. Female footballers are six times more at risk of an ACL injury, while research and data is lacking. Young female athletes across the board are more susceptible to the injury than boys and young men. For 20 years we have known that there's an increased ACL injury rate in women and girls compared to men and boys. The anatomical um, science...
This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Teddy, thanks very much. Uh, coming up next, we're going to be covering bees. We speak to the man who came to the rescue when a swarm threatened players and fans at the Indian Wells Tennis Tournament in California. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News' West of England correspondent. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. Welcome back. Now, normally in this country, if you're watching tennis, it's usually rain that stops play. But it is a very different story in the Californian desert, where a quarterfinal in the Indian Wells tournament in Palm Springs was brought to a halt by a giant swarm of bees. Of course it was. At the world number two, Carlos Alcaraz was stung on the forehead before play was halted for nearly two hours. So what do you do in a situation like this? You call in a professional bee remover, of course. Lance Davis, the owner of Killer Bee Live Removal, happened to be in the area, and he popped by with, as you can tell, see, his specialist bee vacuum cleaner to clean the court. I'm sure he's gonna have a word with me in a second about what it's actually called. Uh, with the bee safely sucked, bees safely sucked into a container, play could finally resume. Story of the week, this one for me. I am delighted to say 
that Lance joins us now, live from Palm Springs in Southern California. Lance, an absolute pleasure to meet you. Welcome uh, to Sky News on a Friday night. Thank you for having me, Neil. Tell me just a little bit about what has been going on at, at Indian Wells. Where were you when you got the call? And, and, and what exactly happened to you? I was in Palm Springs doing another job off of a roof. And I got the call from Ricardo. And he said, you got to get out here, man. This is going on. I said, OK, fine. I'm on my way. And I got out there. And uh, on the way there, as I got closer to the Indian Wells Tennis Gardens, the... Um, Traffic got really bad. But once I got through all that hustle and bustle, I went ahead and got to gate seven. They directed me right up there to the outside of the um, elevator shaft. And I mm -hmm. went up to the fourth floor with all my equipment and um, got ready. And then they brought the uh, spider cam. It, they were on the spider cam. And mm. it was coming over. And they brought it over to me. It was, like, really great. And um, so what happened after that was I started vacuuming up the bees and taking them out. I saw everybody down below, they were, you know, they were really sparse. They got out of the way completely because I guess the beast stung uh, Alcaraz and he was um, really, uh, really leery about going back out there again. No wonder. No wonder, Lance. We're just watching you at the moment. And of course, as you say, you have arrived with your specialist equipment, which, which appears to consist of, and correct me if I'm wrong here, a pair of sunglasses and a vacuum cleaner. Where's the beekeeping suit? Oh, that's for amateurs. I, I don't do that yeah. anymore. I've been doing this for a long time. And I I really have learned how to handle the Africanized honeybees that are here in the desert, as well as uh, the European honeybees. That's what I started with, and it went really well. So so, so when, when you say that this is, and I completely agree with you, clearly a, a, you know, amateurs are the ones who put on the beekeeping suits, how do you know? that those bees which were previously swarming, which previously, you know, stung the world number two on the forehead of all things, you know, that they weren't going to come after you? Um, well, I, I really focus on the bees and how they're handled, and I bring my chi down low and keep it nice and calm and, and relaxed, and I give them a lot of respect, because I know what can happen if they get out of hand, and I didn't want that to happen, especially in a stadium like we were in a completely round circular stadium, it could have got a lot worse. And I didn't want to excite them. I wanted to make them feel very relaxed. I was going to really take care of them. You want to, when you deal with bees, you got to greet them like, like, like when you hold a newborn baby. That's the feeling you got to have really? all the time. And they will, they will usually uh, respect you as well because yeah. you're giving them respect. Uh, see, the problem, the problem, Lance, is I, I, I was... I, I'm, I'm going to make myself look like an absolute idiot here. At the age of nine years old, I was chased down my street by a bumblebee, or at least I, I thought I was. The thing was right here, and, and kind of ever since that point, the idea of taking my hands and scooping up a big pile of, of swarming bees, it, 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 it doesn't exactly grab me in, in quite the same way uh, that it clearly grabs you, but... But let's be fair about it. You saved the tennis. You're enjoying some some international uh, praise from all around the world. Absolutely. Even, even films, even film stars like Ben Stiller are getting involved to say what a hero you are. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. I love him. And uh, I mean, is this is this newfound fame um, something that you have been something that has come as a bit of a shock to you? I mean, as it, as as I've just been discovering today, I mean, plenty of people are interested in, in bee rescue like this. You've even got your own TV show as well. Yes, I do. It's on EarthX TV, and in England, uh, in the UK, it's available Can, as well. It's on the Sky platform, in fact. I'm told. It is on your platform exactly. So to tell yeah. me, what, sorry, carry on. Sorry, carry on. Oh, I just want to say, I've seen what can happen when. By, from other people that try to do what I do, and the bees get out of control. In fact, I was just over in uh, Bermuda Dunes, which is on the way to Indian Wells, uh, about four days ago, and somebody took a beehive out of somewhere in the back of somebody's yard, and uh, the bees were stinging the kids across the street, which were at the uh, Desert Christian Academy, and um, they had to call me out there and investigate where it was, and mm. I, I said, I can go in there and finish the job because there's bees everywhere. They're really mad. And the lady says, no, no, he'll handle it tomorrow. I go, people are getting stung now, but you want to wait till tomorrow. I go, it's all the liability is on you. Nobody else but you. So that's where it's at. And I, le I left it. I couldn't do anything.
Mancha, explain, why exactly were the bees swarming and why on earth did you choose that, that camera hanging, dangling above the, above the tennis court as the, as the place where they were congregating? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. And the reason why they were doing that is because, first of all, there's people movement all around there, but the low frequency sound waves, they don't hear, but they can feel the vibes. That's why they came in there is because of the fact that they're, they're attracted to that low frequency noise uh, for, from the, the vibrations. And they came there and the, see the top of that, um, that cam, that, that spider cam? Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the sun, so it's nice and warm. And that's probably the only warm thing there for bees because of the fact that they are cold-blooded creatures. And anything be below 57 degrees, they don't fly. And they don't do it any well uh, at about um, 65 degrees. So it was about 64 degrees. So they were looking for a place that was warm and comfy for the night that they could relax on. Uh, Lance, Lance, given that for the day job, you, you pick up bee swarms with your bare hands, what do you do to relax? Um, go home and watch a news channel or maybe uh, Netflix or something like that. Just relax and play with my daughter. She's, she's three years old and she just loves her daddy. And we I just have a little fun with doing the... Um, the button push where you push for different things on the map, oh. and it says, you know, what it is. I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, it's really fun. I play with her. Her name's Kathy. She's great. Well, do you know what, Lance? I am certain, like like many, many other people, not least of which, of course, the world number two, Carlos Alcaraz, that your daughter will be very, very proud of her daddy. Um, Lance, I'm afraid we have to leave it there only for reasons of time. I could talk to you for another hour, but I just want to say thank you on behalf of the tennis and, indeed, on behalf of Sky for talking to us. Thank you very much, Neil, for having me. I appreciate it. What a lovely guy. Time for a quick look at the weather. <laughs> Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And the weather remains mild but unsettled this weekend with further showers or longer spells of rain. Thicker cloud over parts of eastern Britain will bring some drizzly rain this evening. The earlier daytime showers will fizzle out, leaving most places dry. Uh, high pressure overnight means the winds will ease, showers will fade and temperatures will drop as the sky is clear. Some fog patches are likely, as well as a widespread rural frost. However, the cloud will build in the southwest, bringing rain and drizzle to parts of the southwest. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that is your lot for this edition of Friday Night with Neil Patterson. Coming up next, it's Sky News at 10. We will see you next week.